All right, we'll get started in about one minute. If you could start finding your seats, we'll get started in about one minute or so. Well, I'm very excited to again be moderating a star-studded panel. Uh, this afternoon's panel is focusing on enforcement, and I will uh, give introductions of each of the panelists and then give a brief intro because we have so much uh, that we are excited to hear about from each of them. So first, I will uh, introduce Twali, uh, excuse me, I just confirmed your name and then I said it wrong immediately. Twala Abramson, Abrahamson, who's the Executive Director of the Indigenous Rights and Reparation Foundation. She's an enrolled Spokane and descendant of the Colville, Coeur d'Alene, and Navajo nations. Abrahamson is a graduate of the University of Washington with a degree in environmental studies and a minor in restoration ecology. She has been a social health and environmental justice organizer for over 20 years. She worked for several years in the Natural Resource Management Program for the Spokane Tribe. Abrahamson worked for the Washington State Human Rights Commission as a civil rights investigator, serves on the Washington State Office of Equity Community Advisory Board, and the Indigenous Environmental Network Board of Directors. She is currently the Executive Director of the Indigenous Rights and Reparation Foundation. With me to my right also is Bill Sherman, the Assistant Attorney General for the Washington State Attorney General's Office and Chief of the Environmental Protection Division of the AG's Office here in Washington. The Environmental Protection Division brings litigation under state and federal laws that protect Washingtonians and our environment, including civil lawsuits and environmental criminal prosecutions under state law. He's a graduate of the University of Michigan Law School, where he was editor-in-chief of the Michigan Law Review. He has served as Special Assistant to the U.S. Interior Secretary Bruce Babbitt and as a Deputy Prosecuting Attorney in King County and as a Visiting Professor at the Seattle University School of Law. And to my left, I have Colleen Melody, the Civil Rights Division Chief of the Washington State Attorney General's Office. The Civil Rights Division enforces federal and state laws protecting the rights of vulnerable populations in Washington with an emphasis on civil rights and anti-discrimination work. She leads a team of attorneys, investigators, and staff on enforcement matters statewide. Prior to joining the Attorney General's Office, Colleen Melody serves a, served as a trial attorney in the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. There, she brought enforcement actions to remedy discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, religion, and disability. Following law school, she served as a law clerk to Judge Ronald M. Gold of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. And we have Katie Scott, the water protector from the Spokane Riverkeeper. Katie Scott was born and raised right here in Spokane and is highly passionate about clean water and environmental justice. Katie attended Wapadit High School on the Spokane Indian Reservation and then went on to earn a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Washington. She then earned her JD with a certificate in public interest law from Loyola University Chicago School of Law. During law school, Katie spent her summers working as a whitewater rafting guide and kayak guide while also working in a personal injury firm. Seems like one of those would be more fun than the other. <laughs> Prior to joining Spokane Riverkeeper, Katie worked in plaintiffs, excuse me, now as a water protector at Spokane Riverkeeper, Katie manages the clean water defense and river flow protections, uh, the, the water conservation program. So we're so pleased to have everyone here. And I get a good. So when we met briefly to prepare for our panel, um, Everyone did a brief introduction of themselves and their work, and it made me so excited for today's uh, panel presentations. Everyone here is engaged in really exciting environmental justice work. And this work is both from 
a uh, enforcement perspective uh, at the state level and at the federal level and from a citizens focused uh, emph emphasis. And as we've been learning so much throughout today's uh, presentations is that law enforcement has a key role to play in environmental protection. Having key regulations as baseline protections need to be enforced. But we also have to work as a team, both for our government agencies to be engaged at the administrative level, at the uh, litigation stage, but also to have citizens hold the government accountable for fulfilling those duties. And by having a diverse panel here that will speak to how citizens through private lawsuits, through advocacy, through promoting regulations that are gonna better serve our communities, how all of those working together are critical to having effective enforcement of environmental protection laws for the public health and safety of our community. So what we're gonna do is have everyone come up, get you all excited about this panel to speak about uh, what they do and what their role is in their uh, organizations and what they're doing right now to promote environmental justice. So I'll start with Twella. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanna say, um, I appreciate everybody for coming today and um, reflecting on where we're at and where we're going and coming with those questions about what can we do? What can we talk to our families about doing? And um, that we're gonna have some takeaways here and it's not gonna stop. This is gonna be the beginning of this conversation as we get into our celebration of the World's Fair this year. Um, I'm a fourth generation activist and it probably goes back further than that, but I, um, my mother, her name was Deb Abrahamson and she was the founder of Shaw Society, Sovereignty, Health, Air, Water and Land. And she also was at the expo. Um, some people have come up and talked to me already, but she um, she was crowned um, Miss Indian World or Miss Environmental World or something, you know, at expo. And so um, I've, I'm learning more about, you know, that process and just that there were a lot of different tribes represented at that time. And um, she was able to, come away from the, the expo and representing the community and kind of speaking as an ambassador um, for Spokane and for the indigenous people here in this area. So that's that's something that I'm looking forward to do is how do we, you know, memorialize that, but also, you know, continue her work. Um, um, I have grandmothers and great grandmothers that were arrested for continuing to practice our cultural ways here. So we consider those, you know, those activists too, those that were not willing to move to the reservation, those that stayed in Spokane and didn't, you know, didn't leave. Um, those are activists. Um, and when we're talking about environmental justice and indigenous people, you know, I think the first thing happened a long time before Expo, and it was about the colonization and di displacement of our people. Um, every group of indigenous people, um, our culture is directly tied to our surrounding environment. So each tribe, each nation, each group of indigenous people, their, their ways of life are specifically related to the environment that surrounds them. So I really wanna thank Margo for kind of explaining how important the salmon are to our people here. And, but just knowing that every tribe has different foods, have different resources that are important to them. And we also have different ways how we, interact with those resources. So, and base our water quality standards on. So for instance, with the Spokane tribe, you know, their water quality standards are based on human health protections for those of us that eat fish. And there's a lot of other foods that we eat and interact with. And I just appreciate, you know, the, the, the photo of the water potatoes, because that's another one of our traditional foods and our resources where we are digging into that those layers of sediment in the Coeur d'Alene Basin, in some of our other surrounding lakes. And, you know, we're kind of squishing around in the mud, we're bringing our kids out there. 
and you know going for these resources. Um, we're also out on the plateau lands and we're digging roots and we're you know we're collecting plants that you know have are next to you know wheat fields. And so as we're out there, we're seeing these pesticide planes drive over. We're seeing them, you know, drive down the road while we're out there, you know, practicing our traditional cultural ways. So there's there's a lot of different ways that, you know, our, our people, because we're so connect, directly connected to our environment, that we have some different ways of exposure. And it, it brings into that, that cumulative impact. You know, we... Um, we're seeing that there, there isn't a whole lot of studies about, um, about how some of these chemicals interact with each other. So for instance, I'm from the, the Spokane Reservation and we have a Superfund site there. And in that Superfund site, there's about 30 chemicals of concern that were, you know, when they initially studied the site. Um, and each one has a page about, you know, different health effects, different, you know, levels that they're safe at, but there's not a whole lot about how some of these interact with each other. Um, and when some of the standards were set, like as a community, we were looking at who are these standards based on? Um, and a lot of times it was not indigenous people. It was not the way we interact with the land. And, you know, they may be based on a Caucasian family living in the suburbs. And so that that didn't really directly um, address our needs as a community because some of our ways of life, including our ceremonies, um, are directly impacted. Um, we have a sweat lodge ceremony where we're kind of enclosed in a small space and we're putting water on heated rocks. So ingesting it and breathing in these chemicals have a whole different way of exposure than maybe just drinking it in water or maybe some other ways where your body might not totally intake it. But when when there's different ways like that, like inhalation of some of these chemicals, it's not wasn't widely studied. Um, so we were very fortunate to to be able to work together with some of the other tribes who had been um, kind of looking at some of these issues and and help use those to help determine cleanup levels for our own community. Um, then we were faced with the hydropower dams, you know, in the upper Columbia here. And I think that that's a major issue that is like, we can't have salmon ceremonies without salmon. Um, we still do because we don't want to lose that practice, but it's, you know, Margot brought up a, a good quote by um, Sherman Alexie. One of my favorites is, you know, we're living here where the ghosts of salmon jump. And we're living in this area where, um, you know, we're waiting for the salmon to come home. And as communities, we're preparing and we want, you know, we want them to have clean, healthy rivers. We want to address the pollution, the temperature, the flow, um, because they're fighting to come home. And one of the most impactful things, if you ever get a chance to visit the dams and to watch how hard these salmon are trying to get back to us. And that's how hard we all need to fight to give them a home to come back to. So one of the most tragic things that you'll see is these salmon jumping and hitting the dam. But take that imagery and, you know, fight that hard because they're, they're trying to make their way back here. And they know where home is. So that's one of the great things and one of the great successes that we've heard is that, you know, our tribes are releasing salmon and they're studying, you know, what's it going to take to get them back up here? And they're they're making their way back home. So we have three salmon from the Spokane Reservation that have been released in different areas. They made it all the way back out to the ocean, did their rounds, and three made it back up to Chief Joseph Dam. And so we're, you know, we're hoping that in our lifetime, our children are be able to, to see salmon in our rivers. Um, the first time I ever saw live salmon, I had to go to Alaska. And um, other than that, we, our tribes get, um, we have agreements with some of the, the hatcheries downstream. And we go stand in a line and, you know, get our salmon brought to us on ice. And that's the only way it's come back to our diet. Um, since the construction of the dams, um, our kids were starting to refuse salmon at our traditional gatherings. And that's where the women in our community, those grandmothers, the aunties, you know, they couldn't believe that our kids 
didn't want salmon, you know, because it was so essential to our way of life and it was already being lost in a few generations. Um, and then I'm glad, you know, talking about some of the new, the forever chemicals, you know, they're all around us, but um, we have different tools that we've used as well. So those water quality standards um, and really connecting with other communities. So I think that's been one of our successes um, in the uranium industry and other mining industries is that we're, you know, maybe a, a small handful of people on our reservations that are concerned about these issues and we're up against the, the top corporations in the world. And the only thing that has made our voices stronger um, is coordination and working together with the other impacted communities. So Spokane, for instance, you know, we're learning about the Marshallese communities that are here and the significant number of Marshallese people that are in Spokane and how some of our, our health issues are the same. So we definitely, um, we know that those connections are there and we know that there's, there's a lot of work to do to ensure that some of those past wrongs um, that people are getting the health care that they need. And um, so I'll stop there and then we'll answer some more on the question portion. But thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Bill Sherman. I'm with the Washington State Attorney General's Office uh, and I'm with the Environmental Protection Division. I just want to start off by saying uh, when you work in environmental issues, you spend a lot of time with bad news. Right, you spend a lot of time getting depressed. And it is so heartening to be in this room with all of you who are focusing on bringing creativity and smarts and hard work and dedication and community to these issues. Uh, I'm really, really heartened by all that I've heard and learned today. Um, so my little introduction, uh, so the Environmental Protection Division is a pretty new part of the Attorney General's office. Attorney General Ferguson established our division in 2016. And our mission is to bring affirmative civil and criminal uh, uh, litigation, lawsuits and environmental crimes, where they arise from the Attorney General's independent authority under state or federal law. That's a pretty broad mission. And so we've had a chance to really create our portfolio of work as we've grown since 2016. And what we've tried to do is to imbue everything that we do, every category of type of case that we do with environmental justice from the start. So to so start off with uh, about environmental crime, and so we rely on the state code to bring environmental crimes and stand in the shoes of a county prosecutor's office to uh, to to bring those uh, those cases. Um, and uh, and had you come to the attorney general's office 15 years ago, 18 years ago, with an environmental crime and said we we want you to prosecute this, they would have said we don't. Do that. Uh, but we do do that now. And what we try to do is to focus on high impact cases where we can work with affected communities towards solutions. An example is uh, a year ago, we took a guilty plea in a case dealing with a, a, a small hydroelectric mine operator called the Electron Hydro Dam in the Puyallup River that runs between Mount Rainier and uh, the operator of that dam had done some maintenance on the dam and it decided it was a good idea to use field turf, which any of you who have ever played soccer or been around people who play soccer know that you got all those rubber crumbs in your socks whenever you're around field turf. <laughs> That stuff's full of PPD, which then turns into 6-PPD quinone, which kills coke. And so when you put all that in the river and those crumbs wash 22 miles downstream, it causes untold harm to that resource. Now we were able to get a guilty plea from that company and its manager, and we're able to negotiate a restitution award that sent uh, uh, three quarters of a million dollars to the Puyallup Tribal Fisheries as the custodian of that resource to use as they could see fit to make sure that they were restoring that resource. And so looking for opportunities like that, where we can craft a, a, uh, a resolution to a criminal case that involves community input and involves sovereigns uh, like the Puyallup Tribe can be really important. Another category of things that we do is kind of big statewide lawsuits dealing with massive pollution issues. There's been some discussion about uh, different litigation against the Monsanto Corporation over PCBs. So our statewide case on behalf of the state of Washington against Monsanto was led out of our division uh, and resulted in a $95 million dollar settlement four years ago, which was the largest single source environmental settlement 
uh, in, in state environmental law history. Uh, and we know from everything that we've heard earlier today that PCBs do not affect everyone equally. If you're relying on fish that biomagnify, bioaccumulate those chemicals, if you're relying on fish for subsistence, you're going to be excuse me, far more affected uh, by, uh, by those crimes, or by those, uh, those pollutants. Um, another type of case that we bring is civil suits under federal environmental law. These are citizen suits under statutes like the Clean Water Act. The state is a citizen for the purposes of, uh, of the Clean Water Act. And one example of a case that we have using that law is a case against Crown Resources, which is the owner of the Buckhorn Mine in Okanagan County, uh, that has been in violation of its clean water permit for as long as anyone can remember. We forced them to admit to over 3,000 monthly violations of their Clean Water Act permit. Um, but as we work toward resolution of that case, we want to make sure that we are consulting with sovereigns and other affected individuals and communities as we can put together some kind of a resolution uh, that can restore the resource. And so uh, I see Asa Washington's here, our state tribal liaison, who's working with connecting us uh, with, um, uh, uh, with the Colville tribes to talk about how we can, uh, we can consider the solutions for that sort of case. Um, Another type of case that we bring is cases dealing with environmental review. Uh, you know, one case, one statute that we haven't talked a lot about today is NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, and that's a statute that requires community input when the government's making a big decision. Community input is one important pathway for, uh, for environmental justice communities to make sure that impacts on them are being heard in that process. And so one example about the, uh, of the way that our office used that law uh, is to sue the federal government to stop the plan to open the Arctic wildlife refuge to oil and gas drilling on the coastal plain. So our office led a multi-state coalition. We were the lead state and multi-state coalition against the department, a lawsuit against the uh, Department of Interior that resulted uh, in, uh, in, after a change of administration, uh, the, the pausing of, uh, of, of that plan to open the, the, the coastal plain to, to oil and gas drilling. Um, I guess when I think about what we've heard today, we, we've heard that when communities and sovereigns make their voices heard and government leaders are willing to listen, extraordinary things can happen in the environmental justice space. Uh, and we're really lucky to have a lot of those leaders and a lot of those communities here today. Um, I'm really excited to learn, learn more uh, this afternoon. You all are like the hardcore folks. After lunch, after a presentation, after lunch, <laughs> there's still uh, coffee or drinks, hopefully. Uh, but I'm really, uh, really looking forward to learning more as we go forward this afternoon and talking more about how we in the Environmental Protection Division uh, can be a partner and an ally in that, that sort of uh, environmental protection mission going forward. So thank you. I'm going to turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Caitlin Scott. I also go by Katie interchangeably. <laughs> I have no preference for those of you that are wondering. Oh, I am the water protector at Spokane Riverkeeper. Spokane Riverkeeper has the mission to protect, restore, and preserve the Spokane River for future generations. And we do that through numerous programs, uh, many of which are led by our waterkeeper, Jewel, who is here right now, um, and supported in the background by our co-director um, and managing director, Katie. Um, and we are a team of three with a, another staff member who helps us get all these things done. Um, so we have, like I said, the mission to protect, preserve, and restore. So we have a bunch of different programs that fit into that, um, doing restoration projects and removing litter from the, the river. Uh, Jewel and Liv have already removed 22,000 pounds of trash this year. Um, and it's only going to go up. We assume, yeah, and they have done incredible work. <laughs> if you'd like to join and support their work, we'll be at Highbridge Park on April 20th, cleaning up more trash, and you can add to that number with us. Um, we also do, like I said, restoration projects. We've got active projects out in the Hangman Basin, um, as well as supporting work um, going on in the Little Spokane right now. We don't actively have projects that we're just supporting there. Um, and then in my department, we do clean water defense and river flow protection. So that is really the clean water enforcement um, using the Clean Water Act and um, the state laws to ensure that our polluters are held accountable for their pollution. Um, we, I look at their permits 
um, when they come out and provide comment um, on those permits. And much like Bill was saying, we try to provide that opportunity for the public to get involved and share their voice as well. So I'm um, trying to get out ahead of these things, sometimes where you guys can comment back for us and help me send these letters to the college and the EPA. Um, so we're working on that. That's one, one thing that I'm working on to increase our access um, is to provide more space for community. But the bigger thing is we're actually the voice for the river. The river can't speak for itself. Um, it is a living thing out there. Um, blowing by us every day. And I'm so incredibly grateful to have been raised on the reservation in the shadows of Paula and her mother, Deb, and Margot, and all the work that they did on the river and learning from them as I was growing up, it's just incredible. Um, and I'm super happy to um, continue to work here. And it's an honor to be here on some panels to Paula now. Uh, and I'm really excited to continue working um, in this world and continue the great work that they've started. Um, I think, and when it comes to environmental justice, it's really easy to see where tribes have been left out of this process repeatedly. When we look at our water quality standards, the tribe, Spokane tribe, furthest downstream on the Spokane River has the most stringent standards and nobody's ever met them. Nobody's tried to. The first attempt to even try to is this PCB TMDL that we're expecting in May, and that's the first real attempt to actually meet those standards. So it's really um, a turning of the tide, but you know, we, we sit here and rely on the wheels of justice. Somebody said earlier that we can't really enforce these laws without, we can't really do anything about environmental harms without law, but law moves really slowly and environmental de degradation moves really quickly. Uh, so we're really trying to keep up here. And I think um, as we move forward with environmental policy and law, um, it's really important to consider time that it does take and really be, be cognizant of how, how we can, advanced time faster, that sounds weird, but how we can move through these things without getting stuck in the bureaucracy, without getting stuck. And I think a lot of that comes from working with communities. So one thing that we're really prioritizing right now is working with tribes and really listening. We really want to listen to the communities that are really being impacted by these policies and really make sure that we're addressing their needs um, and really, really just listening, really allowing those who have not had their voices heard to have a spot to have their voice heard, and that includes the river. Um, and I hope we can continue to do that. And I think, you know, enforcement is a weird way to do that, but um, somebody has to hold those polluters accountable. And as citizens, you could do it too. Um, it's really difficult to do on your own, but you could. Um, <laughs> uh, and we're just here to help, help you get those things heard. So if you have an issue that you see, we're happy to help you point you in the right direction. Uh, that's a big one of us is helping you be heard. Hi, moving a little slow. <laughs> okay, and so uh, I'm Colleen Melody. I work at the Washington State Attorney General's Office as well. I'm the chief of the Civil Rights Division. So I lead a team of 28 lawyers, investigators, and staff on affirmative civil rights enforcement, meaning that we're the plaintiff, we investigate and bring civil rights actions um, in the name of the state to protect the people. And so I'm like the least enviro person definitely on this panel and maybe all day. I have never brought a cause of action under an environmental statute. None of the acronyms that are up here are ones that I know without having to look them up. And so why am I here and what do I do? So our, our office mostly brings um, cases under the civil rights canon, federal and state laws. We bring civil rights actions uh, to, to uh, protect anti-discrimination rights in housing and employment, educational institutions, in healthcare, in businesses that are open to the public, uh, in government services, uh, in policing. We do police misconduct cases and we do a lot of work around access to reproductive rights lately. Um, and we do that uh, when discrimination is alleged on the basis of a protected class, which in Washington is race, national origin, color, religion, citizenship or immigration status, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, age, and veteran and military status. So on almost every score, the protections available in state law are better and broader, and I like to say badder than under federal law. And so that's a credit to your Washington lawmakers who've seen fit to protect your civil rights in a broader and more protective way than is available at the federal level. 
Um, we also do a ton of outreach. So if I haven't connected with you yet, and that's likely because this is a space that we don't work in as much as some other spaces, I want to. I mean that. Come find me. I want to do outreach with you because we're very interested in the overlap between business practices and regulatory and zoning decisions that have an effect on sort of the environmental conditions and health conditions for underrepresented Washingtonians. Um, so even though I rarely litigate under those environmental statutes, in fact, I never have done so, um, we bring cases all the time under federal laws like the Fair Housing Act. We file complaints under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 with the federal government. And we also enforce uh, state law like the Washington Law Against Discrimination uh, and the Consumer Protection Act in ways that impact some of the environmental and health um, concerns that we've been talking about today. I'll give you a couple of quick examples and then maybe we can talk about them more should they come up during the discussion. But so in uh, zoning and land use, for example, counties and cities, we're really interested in making sure that our local governments are accountable in the way that they decide how land will be used and who that will impact. So who is it that's getting, which community is it that's getting the new park? And which community is getting the urban garden that we saw during uh, Cliff's presentation? And which community is getting the landfill, right? And we're interested in those impacts under, under the laws that we've described because those impact community neighborhoods, Fair Housing Act, Washington Law Against Discrimination housing provisions, even if we're not enforcing federal environmental law, right, or state environmental law. Um, also zoning. Um, when our community, when our local jurisdiction zoning the group home for adults with developmental disabilities or the group home for kids who need special services, and where does the, when there's a zoning board decide that that, that that the only place in our city where it's zoned appropriate for that happens to be the industrial zone, where industrial polluters are also doing business. Um, we're concerned about that based on disability, based on age, right? Um, you know, there's a, a growing need for uh, treatment for, well, for transitional and emergency housing for our unhoused community members and also for treatment for people who are overcoming substance use disorder. Same questions. Which, which of our communities are zoning those out of town altogether or zoning them into zones that their only neighbors are going to be industrial polluters um, and other kind of community, you know, entities that are, that are not safe, that are not going to create a healthy environment for those types of people to, to survive and thrive. Um, on, the, on the private business side, business practices that have a harm for particular groups based on the kinds of unfair or deceptive acts, that's the standard under the State Commu uh, Consumer Protection Act, unfair or deceptive business practices that are particularly harming groups. And I thought for this one, I would give you just an example of our most recent case that we filed on March 22nd. Um, it's the, our state against a suite of companies called Northwest Environmental Solutions, NES Demolition, and Core Environmental Group, along with their uh, shared owner among them. And this company markets, sells, and services, services underground service tanks, which are sort of tanks and their associated piping that are underground and that store gasoline, usually under uh, a gas station, right? There are 80, at least 8,700 of these tanks in Washington storing over 3 billion gallons of fuel. And when these things are not properly serviced, um, they can leak chemicals into the groundwater and contaminate the groundwater, and they can also explode. Uh, and so these companies um, are marketing and, and serving uh, primarily independent gas station owners who are almost entirely, in our case, uh, East and South Asian, uh, a lot of Koreans and a lot of South Asian independent gas station owners, small business owners. And they're doing a bunch of things that are unfair and deceptive taking money from them, promising services, and then just ghosting, uh, doing the services so poorly. We have lots of pictures of things like duct tape and pieces of cardboard being used to service these complicated and high re highly regulated tanks, servicing them so poorly that the gas station owner has to go and pay the same money again to a qualified provider to do the work, or doing the work poorly and nobody finding out about it, thus risking you know, penalties for the gas station owner and groundwater contamination um, for all of us. And so we filed that case and we're gonna be seeking broad injunctive relief as well as restitution to the gas station owners, right? Because those are our, uh, those are our protected Washingtonians based on national origin and sometimes citizen and immigration status who these scammy businesses are targeting for these practices on the hope that they won't notice or know what their rights are to complain. So that's, those are some examples of ways that our, that our agency tries to work in the environmental justice space and in ways that we'd like to connect with you. Thank you.
So see, we have a pretty cool group of people here who are doing amazing things. Um, I just want to kind of carry on a couple themes that were present uh, throughout these introductions to the work uh, on the enforcement panel. I think the two themes that really came out to me were meaningful engagement with the community and using all available tools to promote environmental justice. Uh, so I'll start with kind of meaningful engagement and areas that we are trying to do more of that in the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Department of Justice. So having community outreach sessions, hearing from the public, and making sure that when we are making our enforcement uh, decisions, we have good information from the public about what is most important and what is really happening on the ground. We, as the entities enforcing, often need to know what's happening. We don't have full information. Uh, if communities don't feel safe coming forward with, um, if there's issues with their housing, if there's issues with, you know, subpar uh, maintenance that's happening near them, then there's not the full information for enforcement authorities to move forward. So that's really a key component part of environmental justice and civil rights enforcement is having good information and, and reporting from the community to ensure that uh, our scarce enforcement resources are used uh, effectively. So I want to flag at this moment also a couple other people who are here from my office. So if there's information in this room that you want to share with them, you can catch them before uh, the end of the day. I have uh, Katrina Manis, who's been uh, our environmental justice uh, contract attorney. And then I have uh, three attorneys from my office here uh, who are involved in environmental work as well. Uh, Jake Brooks, I have Derek Taylor, and my first assistant, Rich Barker. And uh, Jake and Derek recently, with uh, members of the Attorney General's team, uh, were part of the environmental task force launching that we are doing for the Eastern District of Washington. And one of the areas that we're trying to really focus our uh, attention on in the department overall, there's efforts to launch these task forces throughout the country. It's one of the component parts of the Department of Justice's comprehensive environmental justice enforcement strategy is to break down some of the information sharing barriers that exist in environmental enforcement. And that happens so often when there's federal laws and federal agents doing one thing, uh, the state and their uh, state ecology who might be the experts on another area, and then local agencies doing work and then the citizens who might not know, well, who's in charge of this component part of the utilities or of the wastewater components. And one of the goals of the task force is to make sure that we are sharing information effectively and that we have the you know, information from where there might be administrative violations and patterns and problems of our frequent violators so that we can focus our enforcement efforts on those individuals uh, or companies most effectively. So if you have information, you can find these people today. And we also have on the Department of Justice, our website, a site dedicated to both civil rights and environmental justice that has a reporting form and we have a hotline number as well. So I do think that citizen engagement and uh, promotion of identifying these are the areas that most matter to the community. These are violations that we're concerned about are so critical in terms of how do we appropriately use our scarce environmental uh, enforcement resources. So that's a little bit of my spiel uh, that I'm very excited about ways that uh, my office and the department are trying to break down those barriers and more fully engage with the community. Now I'll turn to the panel, back to the panel. We talked a little bit about uh, how environmental protection cases can also be environmental justice cases. And over the course of today, we've had pretty broad definitions of what environmental justice is. I would encourage folks to kind of weigh in on what are ways that when we are advocating for environmental protection, we can ensure that environmental justice is done. Maybe I'll we'll start with Colleen. <clears throat> yeah, uh, one of the things I think about when I think about environmental justice is injunctive relief going forward or permanent that can be monitored relief. So as a, as a part of any settlement I'm looking for, for example, I want restitution or compensation for people who've already been harmed in the past. Um, but I also want to make sure that the bad actor doesn't, you know, doesn't 
uh, continue to commit violations. And so when I think about environmental justice, I'm thinking of how long and how broad can we get a court to continue to monitor this entity so that I can continue to listen to the community, go check up, do testing, and make sure that we're not um, continuing to see, you know, business as usual doesn't continue as usual, that we get an actual change. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think on a similar note, when we're looking at enforcing environmental enforcing environmental laws, one of the big issues is having the money to actually do what you're talking yeah. about and coming into compliance. So really considering where is that coming from? How can you get a small town of 300 people to have a wastewater treatment plant that can meet these astringent water quality standards when they don't even have an engineer within a hundred miles. You know, like if you have these complex issues, but the communities are not necessarily uh, the communities you're trying to serve don't necessarily have the the knowledge that's required. So really thinking about ways to partner with other communities and really bring bringing the communities together so that you can have that expertise. Uh, in these smaller areas by just bringing them together and creating one big larger area uh, to, to serve the community. You know, I, I really appreciated when Cliff earlier focused on the language and the definitions of environmental justice, fair treatment and meaningful involvement, right? Fair treatment and meaningful involvement. And the meaningful involvement part of that is not just window dressing, right? That's, that's a key part of what makes something an environmental justice case and a key part about how, as enforcement officials, we can make sure that we're listening to community and taking uh, community's needs into account when filing a case, litigating it, settling on a resolution that includes injunctive relief. Um, and, and sometimes we have limited tools around that, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm a part-time criminal prosecutor, right? Uh, under state law, uh, until a couple of weeks ago, our state law only really authorized restitution or harm to property or individual people, human's health, right? You get, you know, someone breaks your window and they're convicted for malicious mischief, you can get a restitution order for the cost of that window or their medical bill. Uh, but a, a bill that was passed by the legislature, signed by the governor a couple of weeks ago, introduced by uh, Senator Trudeau, uh, adds harm to the environment and natural resources to the definition of restitution under state law. And so what that means is going forward under state environmental laws, under our state Clean Water Act, Solid Waste Act, and Clean Air Act, we can ask a sentencing judge to order a defendant corporation to pay for harm to the environment in addition to harm for property. That's meaningful involvement because it means downwind, downstream communities may be able to have their voices heard at sentencing in a way that they have not been heard before. So there, there are ways that, that we can move forward on that. Um, I think I just want to echo that and um, bring up free prior and informed consent is that, you know, it, it's great to see that some, you know, the TikToks are back because there it used to be a program under a different name and, you know, really getting our community prepared to participate in some of these processes. Sometimes what our concerns are don't necessarily translate into the law. And they don't necessarily translate into things that are enforceable. Some of the tribal values and when we would have tribal elders speak, you know, it, it didn't fit in the guidelines of what the regulators were there to listen to. Um, and so what we had to do was go outside of the community and use some of these resources, um, because what we know is in our, you know, EPA has a team working on each site. Um, the the company itself has a team working on these sites. The environmental consultants have a team. And sometimes in tribes, you have one or two staff members that are assigned to these sites. Um, a lot of times it's one. And so um, it, it took those resources for us to be able to educate our own community about some of the these contaminants and about some of the health impacts, but also our service providers. And we had a lot of um, a lot of positive feedback from some of the, the doctors in the region, you know, our rural health providers wanted to come learn about some of these contaminants because they were seeing it in the people that they treat. But it took those efforts to really hold, you know, toxicology 101 classes in our community and kind of build this knowledge base before people 
we're able to make effective comments in, in some of these processes. Thank you. Yeah, the additional resources that are prerequisites for meaningful engagement are things like the Tic Tacs and the you know, resources that give people the information that they need in order to engage. One area that I want to circle around on in terms of meaningful engagement and all available tools, uh, just one more time, was having remedies like uh, restitution and uh, securing relief for victims and having the victim be the environment is an amazing tool. So what uh, the task force model is also looking at is, well, we have these available options under federal law, which might have these restitutionary options, but if we're communicating more effectively with our state partners, we can decide, well, this state regulation, if we file under this charge at the state level, there's gonna be different opportunities for our victims to be heard. Or there might be an opportunity where there's a large federal case, but then there's gonna be smaller, uh, entities that we would be able to have better restitution for at the state level. So using all available tools, civil rights legislation or uh, environmental protection as all options. So we also were speaking a bit about the limitations of environmental protections law, protection laws that we see in our enforcement work, such as limitations on what the law prohibits, if there's jurisdictional issues, or technical limitations of detecting and testing for harmful environmental conditions. So I, from the group here, what are some of the limits of the laws that you're using um, and how, you know, what are ways that you wish that could be uh, not those challenges? And you, you touched on that a little bit already. I, I would say um, for years, I was the air quality manager for the Spokane tribe. And, you know, in a, alongside of our water quality standards, we've also been designated a class one airshed. And that was in response to a proposed um, coal fired power plant that would have been built in Davenport, Washington. And um, so the, there's, there's, there's been that effort and the, the, it opened up for tribes to actually enforce their own um, air quality air sheds. Um, so right now the Spokane tribe has um, jurisdiction to look at permits within 100 kilometers of their exterior um, reservation boundaries. Um, and I know that some tribes were able to get in on that when it first opened and made available to tribes. And then there was a big block by states to prevent new tribes from getting that. So I, I had some questions. There's some staff from the, the Kalispell tribe here because they were one of the tribes that were in that process and trying to get that designation for their reservation. Um, but but again, there was a big, you know, a pushback by the states to give tribes that right. Um, and so we, we kind of see that there it's different depending on the state. And we're very fortunate here in Washington um, for the amount of protections that we have, um, especially those that have come on that are new, you know, 15 years to me, that's new. Um, and, but we also, we, some of our, our issues are cross state, they're international, you know, where we have a waste stream that right now is going to the White Mesa Mill in the Four Corners area. And, and so it's something that, you know, we have different agencies regulating different portions or different sites. And so, um, especially on the nuclear side, you know, Washington State Department of Health is a, a regulator as, you know, alongside EPA for, you know, sites that are owned by the same company. Um, but we see different outcomes and we see different people or different, you know, even different community engagement policies between the two agencies. Um, we see, you know, our tribal leadership not even allowed on the site that's adjacent to the reservation, but may have some more pull on the, the site that's located on the reservation. So I think the difference in agencies and the difference in oversight, um, it, it creates barriers for our, our communities, as well as that capacity. You know, a lot of times I still feel like we're, we're um, dependent on the, the company doing their own cleanup. We're dependent on this mining company monitoring their, you know, presenting their own air quality and water quality data. And we just have to use that. Um, and so I think that increasing the capacity for the tribes to do their own enforcement is really important. I, I'm just gonna, getting back to kind of the question about kind of where are the gaps kind of in the current law. I'm just gonna throw out one kind of common, old timey common law problem and one statutory problem. You know, one, one type of claim that we've used effectively is the old tort of nuisance. 
right? When we sued Monsanto over PCBs, you know, our core claim was nuisance. We had some other claims in there too, but that, you know, that bottom line, the idea was that Monsanto made this product knowing it was going to harm us and, uh, and it got everywhere. Same kind of claim is at the core of our PFAS lawsuits. We, we, I'm assuming most folks here know about PFAS. It's in your Gore-Tex, it's in your you know, Teflon, it's in everything. It's in us. Uh, the bad chemical EPA has taken some really huge strides this week. Thank you, Cliff, and your colleagues, to, uh, to, to uh, address that. Um, but we're suing 3M and DuPont and 18 other companies uh, because, uh, because of the nuisance that PFAS has caused. Uh, but that claim of nuisance sometimes asks you to weigh the benefits and the burdens, right? Uh, what are the benefits of something? Is it a reasonable burden uh, to accumulate this pollution? Uh, it doesn't ask who that burden's placed on, where that burden's concentrated, uh, how that overlaps with historic burdens uh, and, uh, and other types of harms. Uh, and so I think there are some kind of fundamental flaws in some of those types of tort claims. And another, uh, I was talking to uh, Jonathan Monroe Hernandez, who is the uh, AAG in our division, who's really focused specifically on environmental justice issues, uh, uh, what other sorts of things we should bring up. And he said, you know, you go back to the fundamental fact that environmental law permits pollution, right? You, you read the Clean Water Act, first couple of sentences, you're like, this is great. All discharges are prohibited unless covered by a permit. And then the permits cover everything, right? So, uh, so you know, looking at how these laws are structured, where it starts off by saying these impacts are are going to be allowed, and then moving from there. Uh, so there's there's some of this issues that are, that's kind of built into the statutes. Kind of building on what Bill's saying, there are are we're really limited to only addressing the contaminants that are there are standards for. And we can only have standards when there's science that supports those standards. So EPA is not going to create a standard for PFAS without the research that supports it. But that research takes a lot of time and it has to be peer reviewed and there has to be done repetitive times before there's going to be a standard. But we already know when the research started that this contaminant's a problem. So there's a real gap between what the law is able to do when it comes to emerging contaminants and when when we're able to respond to these things and when it can go into permit and how we can actually respond to emerging contaminants, especially things like PCBs, PFAS, um, and even now microplastics. We don't know how we're gonna address those. We don't even know what they're doing, where they are. <laughs> Means we have to do the research first. <clears throat> I guess maybe to go a different direction with some of the limitations, you know, I think we're limited, especially as government regulators by what we know about. And government has not been particularly good. I, you know, I'll speak for the state, but I think really at any level, at going out and understanding what's going on in particular communities, you know, we're, we'll we'll listen to you if you come to us, maybe, right? But not as good at going out and finding out what are problems or issues that are being experienced by communities. And so, one issue as an example that we've been dealing with are emergency alerts in Washington for wildfires. You know, I grew up in Spokane. And in the 80s and 90s, we didn't have the wildfire summer experience that now happens here, right? Things have changed. And so when wildfire alerts go out or landslide alerts go out, what languages are those going out to? Who, who is being warned so that they can stay safe? You, were, you brought up the Marshallese community. Are, the, are, the, are those alerts going out in Marshallese or in Spokane in Russian and Ukrainian languages that we know people need, but that they might need elsewhere in the state? What about our Spanish speakers, right, in other parts of the state? And so keeping ahead of those issues before sort of trying to prevent tragedies before they happen, environmental related tragedies, rather than update our policies once something horrible happens. And government just isn't that good at that. Right, we're trying to be better about it, but anticipating and preventing problems is is something that we need to do much better on, rather than just react once something um, comes to our attention because something horrible has happened. This is a question a little bit more for Caitlin and Twala. For enforcement to be effective, laws must promote the level of environmental protection that a community demands. Can you describe your efforts to ensure enhanced environmental standards? I'll start with this time. Sure. So at the Riverkeeper, we, like I mentioned, we do a lot of monitoring permits. Um, Jerry spent a lot of time when he was the Riverkeeper reading the permits, and and now I get to do that. Um, so part of that, um, when it comes to looking at the 
enforcement side is really looking at whether the permits are meeting what we know these chemicals are doing. It's like I was saying with emerging chemical contaminants, some of the research does exist, but it's not always getting to the decision makers. So consulting with experts who might know more and getting their research and getting it over to the right people and making sure that it, everything's being considered um, properly is one way. Um, another way is really telling the story of the people that are impacted and, and bringing people in to, to speak to what they're experiencing, speak to what's happening on the ground, speaking to you know the harms that they're really seeing in their own backyard, in their own living room, um, and really um, getting that voice out there of the, for the community and for um, the river too. And what effects are we seeing on the river? Where are we seeing the flows drop? When do we see the flows drop? Where What's happening and telling the, that story that's really the back of the story to uh, why it's important for us to address these um, environmental issues. Um, I think I touched earlier about um, the different exposure scenarios for our communities and how important that was in standard settings for cleanup at the Midnight Mine site. And um, it's just, it's really, it took years and years and years to fight for that, years and years to include other species other than cows or, um, you know, the the plant life. Um, I think there's there's a lot of different plants we use in different ways, and we have a lot of basket makers and that type of thing that are putting the grass in their mouth, and they're just processing and working with plants in a different way. And so making sure that a lot of different species are looked at and the impacts to the environment as a whole, and not just, you know, one particular you know, one particular chemical at a time, um, that, that cumulative impact assessment, I think is really important because we spend so much time and we're just, we have so many different types of exposure. Um, but I really feel like that was important for our community and getting, um, you know, we're drinking more water, we're eating more fish, we're, you know, how is our community different than what these standards proposed are? Because really, if we want to see this outcome, a positive outcome in the end, we have to have those set for us in the beginning. And in order for those to be set at the beginning, they have to be included. The community has to be there sharing what is valued at the beginning of the process and not just the end. Thank you. That's an incredibly valuable point. Uh, cumulative impacts and how that speaks to communities that are overburdened with pollution that might be coming from several different sources. And our laws are limited often in we regulate this, but not this, and this, but not that. And that can really leave gaps in enforcement that can be very frustrating because it's not capturing the full impact of uh, what a community needs. So I have my saved question for hope at the end. So don't worry, I'll, I'll save a little bit on that. Um, but I do want to open uh, the floor to questions for our amazing panel. Uh, I'm I'm Rick Eichstead. Um, it, government enforcement is great. It's often subject to politics, and our Congress, in its wisdom, in enacting the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act, included citizen supervision. In fact, Senator Muskie recognized specifically that things like air, clean air, and clean water are too important to be left to politics. Um, and I'm just, uh, I've, some some of you know, I've done Clean Water Act enforcement. I've had instances during different administrations where government lawyers would call and say, hey, I can't do anything, but here's, here's an outrageous filing. Um, whether or not that's an ethical issue on their part is another story. But um, I guess I'm just kind of curious you know, as both government and nonprofits, what do you see as your role collaborating with each other, particularly when you may be hamstrung by politics or funding or, or other, you know, restraints? So I'll try to jump in a little bit and then I'll turn to everyone else. Um, so there has been a big push within uh, the department with the Office of Environmental Justice to engage in this you know, meaningful connection with our communities, but that can be very difficult when you're in the reality of ongoing litigation. 
we have to speak through attorneys and only speak to attorneys rather than directly to communities who might be involved in a lawsuit. So there are a lot of sometimes, you know, you have to be very careful in how you communicate about ongoing investigations, ongoing, um, you know, litigation that is something that would be very, you know, much a desired result of cleaner air, cleaner water towards the uh, end result. But while you're in that process, you can't actually be as candid and uh, honest with where there could be potential legal liabilities. So I think that that is a, a true challenge. And politics plays a lot of, uh, you know, tough dynamics even on the, the more broad scale. Of we have been living with these really keystone environmental statutes like the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and we really live more in the regulations than in the statutory language. And the regulations will often change when there's a new administration in the White House. And so we lack some of the clarity of, well, we know that this is the law when in four years the law could change when the regulations go through a multi-year process of kind of moving back and forth. So those are ways that politics can be very frustrating in having effective enforcement. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I, I think it's a really good question, and and I uh, and I don't know that I have a, a single answer aside from developing relationships and partnerships as thoroughly and consistently as you can. I think what we found is we are most effective when we're working closely with the United States Attorney's Office, both in the east and the west side of the mountains. I should just say we're really excited about the environmental crimes kind of team uh, that uh, that. Um, that U.S. Attorney Walters putting together here uh, were enthusiastic participants. Uh, and historically, those sorts of interagency information and strategy sharing uh, setups have worked really well. Sometimes we have a state criminal law that's more streamlined than the federal. Usually the federal law has harsher penalties, uh, but also the investigation process can be quite a bit longer. But often we find that we're able to uh, to sort out who can do what uh, for the community in the best possible way. One example recently is diesel emissions fraud. One thing that's fun to do if you have a diesel truck is to break the emissions uh, control systems and hack the chip and you can pollute 300 times more than a regular car and maybe get a little more horsepower or fuel efficiency. Uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, I mean, the sarcastic and appropriately, I guess, but uh, but this is something that folks do. And we worked with the United States Attorney's Office and the EPA Criminal Investigations Division on, in, in the Western District, so they could kind of take take some of the bigger fish, and we could go after some of the individual shops. And we ended up taking five guilty pleas and three hundred thousand dollars worth of of, uh, of agreed fines uh, in a bunch of those cases that really sent a message among the folks who like to do this to their trucks. That we don't we don't want you doing this around people with childhood asthma and in communities that already have over, overburdened uh, air quality problems. And so I think ideally we do more of that, where uh, where we can partner and find who has the best tool, the most efficient tool, to go after the problem. Maybe I would add that like totally right, and that that's always going to be true, both for the groups who are going to have different priorities based on who they're fun who's funding them. Maybe they got a particular grant that requires a particular kind of work that means they have to leave this other thing aside. At the government level, it's going to depend on you know who has won the election and who and what that person's you know policy priorities are and where they're going to choose to put resources. So I think I would say two things. One, just develop redundancies in the relationships. When one of your partners may be sitting out your issue, somebody else might be lighting up on that issue. And so just being ready to be flexible and know who the players are at the local, I mean, you know, the local level, the county level, the state level, the federal level. But then also sort of even if even if one of your partners is suddenly becoming more limited for some reason, they're still going to be doing something. Right. Like even during that administration, it's like unpopular, right, to just announce that the, you know, the EPA is canceled, for example, and like that they're not doing anything. So figure out what that partner is working with and what is doing and feed them that and then feed another partner who has maybe more expanded bandwidth. Right. Just like use your resources smart. Unfortunately, that requires like citizen activists and groups and communities to have this knowledge of what everybody is doing. But, th but they'll tell you like normally the regulators will tell you this is what our focus is right now. And that, and then by process of elimination, you know what maybe they're not going to be working on. But yeah, it's I think it's I think it's inevitable. 
Swala or Katie, do either of you want to get in on that before we go on to the next question? I think they did really well. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been like a master class in environmental justice. I have three issues that I'll try and be brief with. Any member of the panel can comment. The elephant in the room that has not been mentioned today is Fairchild Air Force Base. That is perhaps the greatest single polluter in this Spokane County area. It's under federal jurisdiction, but it's all already could be a Superfund site. I represent Veterans for Peace. We have KC-135 pilots who report to us that it is normal procedure to dump excess aircraft fuel over the Spokane River as they come in to land at Fairchild because it's a smoother landing if they, if they land with an empty tank. So all that excess jet fuel goes into the Spokane River. We've had multiple anecdote uh, reports about that. Second is the Newmont, the Newmont Mine Company that is supposed to be cleaning up the Welpinet, the, uh, the Midnight Mine. And we get anecdotal evidence that they're simply transferring one set of radioactive or uranium polluted dirt to another part of the site. And I'm so glad to have Deborah Abrams, Abraham's daughter here, who some of us believe died from her uranium poisoning at the midnight mine. Third and finally, the Hanford cleanup site, Superfund site. They recently got a billion dollar grant from the federal government, but we're told by state officials that they need 14 billion more to properly clean up that site. Any comments from the panel? If I can take off a, a little bit on the, the Hanford, um, and we spoke at the break about Fairchild and, and the challenges there. And I did notice in uh, Cliff's uh, presentation, it identified where we're seeing PFAS there and that there's uh, currently testing that is going around. Uh, I mean, I know we read in the newspapers about our concerns about water quality in that space. So certainly we're all wanting to have more information and have greater uh, safety for everyone who lives in the Airway Heights uh, region. On Hanford, we have an ongoing incredible challenge in terms of what is the necessary technology that fortunately keeps getting better and better, but no, still not quite enough to fully remediate uh, that location. And so we see huge amounts of funding going into the, the Hanford facility and it's just extraordinarily challenging in order to have the Department of Energy uh, use those funds on the most effective uh, efforts. And we also see really challenging circumstances with waste, fraud, and abuse by government contractors uh, at the Hanford facility. One area that we see amazing citizen engagement is through whistleblowers who have highlighted where some of that waste, fraud, and abuse is occurring, either through small businesses uh, that aren't real small businesses being awarded contracts through fraud. Uh, when we have, we have a ongoing case right now where we actually have uh, a inspector who is making sure that there's not time card fraud occurring by one of the government contractors who has consistently not uh, followed those rules and regulations. And so to try to have more teeth in our enforcement efforts there, we actually have hired a person who their job is to monitor and be that corporate monitor to have there be more teeth involved in ensuring that our uh, scarce financial resources that we're investing largely at Hanford are being used properly. I'll, I'll hand out anything else to the crowd here. I'll just say enforcement has a really important role there. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, I, uh, you know, we we could get into some Hanford discussions uh, uh, here. Uh, my office. We're often on different sides of the V on the sure. yes. My my division, together with our colleagues in the ecology division, uh, uh, are responsible for a, a lawsuit against the Department of Energy. Uh, and its contractor over worker exposure to vapors from the tanks at Hanford, uh, which uh, which led to a consent decree that is still in operation right now. Uh, uh, my division is, has uh, somehow become the division of choice to sue the Navy a lot lately uh, over uh, everything from scraping decommissioned aircraft carriers uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, environmental impact statement inadequacies around noise impacts. And so I, I think I think state enforcement dealing with significant violators like that has a role and the federal government is not immune mostly 
sometimes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, I just I had one comment about the you know just on the the midnight mine issues and um just really staying engaged as much as possible um because they're doing a better job about providing updates to the community about what's going on and that's something that we really advocated for um you know they do monthly reports where are those reports can we find them online um and that's how we learned about a lot of you know a lot of things because it, the site's been closed off for site visits for years during covid and um this year was going to be the first one in about three years and they canceled it because of weather um but we, what we've seen in that process already is that they've had to redo some redesign so even with 10 years of design and planning for this super fun cleanup, um, it was implemented. And luckily this time they built some of these holding ponds with, um, you know, you could see if they were leaking. So they have some, some measures in place to see the effectiveness, which is before they just buried the waste maybe in unlined pits. So now at least they're lined and they're monitoring and they know that some of their designs have failed already. So they've built some square ponds um, which aren't holding. So at, at the corners, they're weak and they're finding leaks in those systems. Um, and we're also seeing some maybe things that weren't expected related to climate change. So, you know, the wildfires coming straight on to some of these super fun sites, burning vegetation, um, followed by record high snow or record high rains. And so it's just it's creating some of these problems that maybe weren't anticipated in the design or the project. So I think staying involved and holding them, you know, holding them to the cleanup standards. But that really takes eyes on it and people showing up at the meetings and, you know, just kind of staying involved. Hi, my name is Mary Lee Gaston, and uh, for years I worked with environmental protection people, county planning, and the Department of Transportation regarding the North-South Corridor. Um, what I want to bring up three issues that related to those things. When one of you talked about uh, retribution, getting going back in the past and saying, "What can we do to the people who are harmed?" I want to bring up these three because they were so important in my own life. Um, on the right off of. Uh, Freya and Lincoln Road, right to the west of it, was Phillips Petroleum Company. And it was an oil refinery through the 30s, 40s, 50s, and maybe 60s. And uh, when we were little children, we used to go over a float boats on the oil ponds where they dumped the salvage or the sludge oil. And eventually it sunk down and it disappeared. And uh, Phillips Petroleum stopped refining oil there. But uh, when the freeway or the new north-south corridor was considered for the area along the railroad tracks there, uh, they couldn't because they found out that 30 years later, the oil was in the aquifer in, the, in those sites. So it was a super fun site and they couldn't get enough to clean it. So it's still there. And then uh, when the north-south corridor began to uh, uh, move over to Havana, where I came to on the... Um, the south and the north, they started to blast on the hill right in that area off of Havana, um, north of Lincoln Road. And when they blasted to get the aggregate out of that mountain to use it to grind up for the, um, they thought they could save money, to grind it up for the surface of the new quarter, they uh, uh, probably a minimum of 10 homes, including my own at that time, were damaged extremely by the blast because the ground there is very unstable. 400 feet down is the underground, the hilliard trough of the Spokane Aquifer. And um, when they damaged furnaces and um, walls and uh, hot water tanks, all of these things pretty much blew up in a one night period in the whole area. We fought the Department of Transportation and they said, why did you build your houses on the uh, area where the uh, hilliard trough of the Spokane Aquifer came through? And the irony was, is my dad built the house that I lived in uh, when they were first married in 1929. But they held the people responsible and they never gave any payback to any of the people whose houses were damaged. And then um, all along that corridor where the, the uh, North-South corridor was being built, there have been these implications of things that happened. In some neighborhoods, the people fought them. 
In other words, they shrugged their shoulders and gave up, but retribution was never made for any of those things, way back to Phillips Petroleum Company. And I just thought it was a point of interest in the discussion here that do we ever go back and get restitution for the tribal people that were hurt for the, all the different areas? And I don't have the answer, but I have the questions. Thank you, Mary Lou. And I think you raise really you know, critical, specific examples right here in Spokane, as we've been seeing with the North South Corridor, where there might not be legal options for how there can be that restitution that may be made whole when there are these longstanding problems. But I think there can be, and I'll bring on the experts uh, who might have some more ex specific experience uh, about this is like, one, if it is a circular area, then there is kind of strict liability that exists for a long time period. So somebody is needing to pay and needing for it to be um, remediated. I think the environmental justice conversation is, can we have some creative options sometimes of, well, even if there's no resolution for this particular violation under the law because of statute of limitations or a inability to you know, seek money from an entity that doesn't exist anymore, what are other ways that we can see a community that has borne disproportionate burdens and find ways to have creative solutions for, for remedies. So I don't know if other folks have any other insights. Um, for our community, one of the, the tools um, is, is called the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. And um, it's something that is, it's ready to sunset. And it's, it's a, it's a, um, it provides that health care and that ongoing um, support for those individuals ha that have worked in the nuclear industry. And um, right now we're we're kind of at a at a place where we're very excited that it passed the Senate um, to renew this law. And um, right now it, it has the opportunity it needs to get passed through the House. Um, but but you know it it just it's it's deregulating in a sense, but the the groups still want to make sure that something is there, um, and it may be an example for other types of pollution. Um, but that that's one one of the tools that we use and that we're advocating that we hope hope stays in place because it does address some of those past injustices um, and especially the cancers for downwinders for uranium miners uranium millers. Um, yeah, thank you. Those are great examples. I was just thinking about the downwinders when you were raising the the other uh, examples of individuals who uh, we believe uh, co contracted cancer from the radiation around the nuclear facility at Hanford. And if there can be, you know, a larger settlement that tries to find some either medical treatment options that are available or financial uh, compensation there can be these creative solutions that exist sometimes. Hi, Megan Kennedy, I'm a local small business owner. And I just wanna bring up the, the broad note that in the tone of environmental justice, it seems that business is rarely brought up in a positive way. I'm just curious when we're talking about waste, fraud and abuse and the significant violators that are faced in these different instances, is there ever a, an outcome of witnessing remorse? Um, and in the, the face of such wrongdoing, um, what do we have a responsibility to reevaluate as far as the culture of business in our society? And how can the business community do a better job of being part of these solutions? The first thing that came to my mind is uh, from Livia's presentation that had the cost of uh, children dying from lead. I mean, that's just such a harsh, dramatic example of how do we not have the cost of doing business be environmental degradation or you know people's lives. And I think that that's where enforcement plays a dramatically important role. Our enforcement you know, penalties need to be strong enough to truly deter bad conduct. Uh, the you know, criminal justice system allows for a you know, 
in, when you're in a sentencing hearing to say, you know, these are all the things that I, I do feel remorse. I you know, should have a reduced sentence because I'm doing all these things that are, are different, or I've, I've changed my life in these ways. And I think the justice system allows for some of that more individualized uh, opportunities for criminal defendants to identify, yes, I, I plead guilty and I uh, request a reduced sentence because of that uh, significant remorse. So we, we do see that in the criminal system. I think it's really, it's a lot harder in the examples that we've seen today that do have like, well, that, that penalty just doesn't seem big enough. And if it's just part of the cost of doing business, then we need to be more stringent. And hopefully through kind of focused and targeted enforcement efforts that can be a powerful way to deter uh, negative conduct. And I, I mean, I think one way that I think that, so in, in a lot of my cases, small business owners are, are are the people that are harmed by scammy business practices because they're not sophisticated enough maybe to know, to, to be able to read the fine print or whatever for lots of reasons. But the other thing I would say is that we're very open to having businesses help enforcement by telling on each other, right? Everybody, if everybody's playing by the rules, then everybody's better off. It's not fair for some businesses to, you know, incur the costs of environmental or other enforcement when they know that their, you know, their competitor in the industry is not. And, you know, I understand that maybe nobody wants to raise their hand and tattle on, you know, their fellow business owner or their, you know, but but you should because it, it really isn't fair for some some people to be playing by the rules and other people to not. And in some of the cases that we've done, some of the best testimony has been by insiders who are like, yeah, this it's everybody knows what's going on here. I can just second that. Uh, you know, I, I, the vast majority of businesses want to do the right thing, right? And, and they're going to be encouraged to do the right thing if they know their competitors are doing the right thing too. And so I think one of the things, uh, you know, as an enforcer, I think about a lot is creating a culture where people know if they're going to do business in the state of Washington, they need to be a responsible citizen. And part of my mission is to have them sometimes see that folks who are choosing to not do that pay a price for it uh, and say, I don't want to be that. Uh, and so I think that that's kind of where it starts. And then I think what Colleen's described is kind of the, that next level of kind of creating a, a true culture of compliance where, where uh, uh, companies and individuals kind of want to help create that environment generally. And so uh, again, most folks want to do the right thing. They need to know that they're not chumps for doing the right thing, right? That, that they're not the only one who's trying to dispose of their waste the right way. Uh, and so uh, that's kind of part of what I see our mission is as involved. Yeah, and if they don't, if you don't want to call out your neighbor specifically, I mean, sometimes it's just a conversation with them and telling them, hey, did you know that what you're doing actually causes this harm? Because some people that are polluters, they don't know that what they're doing is actually wrong at all. And sometimes it does just take that that first conversation. And it doesn't actually lead to a full enforcement action. People will often change on their own if they're just they just understand the consequences of their own actions. Um, and if you don't want to tell your neighbors, have, I'm happy to tell your neighbors so you can tell me. <laughs> I, have, I have a question for um, Twala. So the um, renewal of the Radiation Act, does that allow for, for instance, the individuals who were at Trinity site to have compensation? And does it allow for individuals um, or family members of individuals who did um, die from cancers, but at the time there was the military and others said, well, you know, we're sorry. Um, yeah, it does. And I think one of the, the limitations that we've seen is that um, the record keeping from the industry itself kind of prevented a lot of people from being able to get compensated. So it's a it's a long, arduous process. And a lot of times 
some of those that did get compensated had to hire attorneys to get through the process. So it, it's a compensation program, but it's also not easily accessible. Um, and so, and especially for those that have already passed away, but, but it is available for those families. They just, they have to prove the employment history and the health history. So that's another a limitation that if we don't have these health resources in Spokane and we don't have these cancer screenings or they've already past, it may not show up in their health records. So it, there are definitely limitations, but there's also, you know, the ability to help those that are still getting cancer treatment um, help cover the costs. And I have another question. I don't know if, if, a, if an individual believes that there's something on their property that might be hazardous, who should, should you call the Department of Ecology and and ask them to come and look at it? Or how does one, you know, figure out, okay, is there any contamination here from something that some business that was happening a hundred years ago? I thought like that's, oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, there are grants that the EPA, there's a National Response Center. If you just Google EPA National Response Center, um, there's a there's a 24 hour hotline that you can call and report anything. And very often they will refer it to local authorities, either it'll go down to Ecology, might go down to Spokane County, um, but you can do it. They, they log it and they track it. I, I called it one time. I was riding my bike along a trail in Seattle and somebody had dumped a pile of car batteries on a Saturday night and I called right there. And when I came back, um, the batteries had been cleared. The, the call went down, filtered down to King County, and and things you know sometimes are not that hard. If it is mysterious and requires sampling, um, then they could find the right authority to go out there and do that. But it's it's not your responsibility to go and, and, and take a sample. We certainly don't want you poking a finger in, in anything. <laughs> there are resources. This really should be your tax dollars at work. So I, I'd say put them to work. And and there's other hotlines available state and local levels as well. But if you remember one thing, the National Response Center, um, Google that, find a phone number, and they'll find the right people for you. Thank you. Any other? I'm Jules Schultz. I uh, work for the Spokane Riverkeeper along with Katie. Um, I have a question about fish. Your, I think it was your office that called me when there was a large fish kill on the river earlier this year. Um, and that got me thinking, we've been talking a lot about sort of the, the harm of chemicals to um, and this role in environmental justice, but we really haven't talked about fish and the role that sort of what we've done to the environment have killed fish, taken away a cultural resource, and a resource really that's more than cultural as well. Um, from tribal members that they really depend on. Um, what's the role of enforcement sort of in that restoring the fish native fish populations um, and how can that be used? Yeah, it's a great question. So we uh, we work really closely with the State Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, on, uh, on fish and wildlife enforcement in terms of direct, you know, stuff that violates RCW 7715. Uh, uh, those are cases that we are, um, uh, we work with them closely to, to uh, see if there are cases that our office might be interested in prosecuting criminally. Um, you know, I, I think your question is broader, though, right? It's about kind of the, the general mission of restoring fish. Um, and uh, and what we've got, of course, is a system where uh, from, you know, the, the headwaters to the mouth, there are different sorts of things that are just trying to kill the fish every single step of the way. Uh, and, and when you look at, uh, at chemicals, uh, uh, land use, uh, fish obstructions, dams, culverts, uh, uh, fishing, overfishing, uh, you know, there's really any, any one of those can have a role in helping create an environment where fish can be restored. Uh, so I think the broad answer to your question is all of the tools that we use can be a part of that solution. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a, this is a, fish state we are we are we are all salmon people uh, and so it's it's something that that's really important to to the culture i think for everyone all right so i'm gonna go oh, oh i have one last question and he just walked out the door so maybe you can yeah. maybe you can answer it um and to build off what she said over there i was part of the wash dot group that looked at building the freeway 
Um, and we talked about the black tank and Hilliard a lot. And I would really like to know where that is. My understanding of it is pretty poor, but what my understanding was, was that they were afraid of doing anything about the oil on top of the aquifer for fear of stirring it up. And so the deal was to leave it pretty much open to air for 400 years and it will all disappear. I just wanted to know about what was really happening with that aquifer because the the oil is there, everybody agrees it is. And are we actually doing anything to remove it? Sure, if, if we're the ones who have any answers up yeah. here. I actually wonder if um, folks from uh, Marlene or Ecology who are at the panel this morning might have a little bit more of an update. All right, well we'll, well, we'll we'll give that to Cliff. I think we'll have time uh, uh, in our yeah, final yeah. session yeah. to save that one up. Um, so I would like to know as well, and I, often things take excruciatingly slower than we would like them uh, to take in so many of our enforcement actions. Um, but thank you for raising that and we'll, we'll try to return to it. So I think that I might take this opportunity to go to my hopeful question. Um, I'm gonna start with a little bit of a downer, but it's gonna end well. So it's gonna be, um, the, the downer part is kind of recognizing the state of the law, especially federal law, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act. Uh, we've been losing a lot of uh, tools through Supreme Court decisions that have limited the jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act and limited some of the authority uh, under the Clean Air Act. And those can feel like pretty rough blows as we are trying to advocate for environmental protection and the clean and healthy environment. But despite these legal rollbacks, we are still making progress. And I would love to hear from our panelists about a case or an environmental initiative, uh, legislative changes or new enforcement strategies that has given them hope and excitement in the last several years. Maybe I'll start with uh, Colleen. Yeah, well, so, I mean, I used to be a Fed and I work at the state and now, and, and what I've learned in that is that the state toolkit is really broad. So the federal government is not the only game in town. They have some very powerful tools, but the state tool toolbox is, is good and getting stronger. And so my sort of optimistic legislative update was in 2021, when the Washington legislature recognized formally that not all communities bear burdens of unfair and deceptive business practices in the same way. And so they updated the state's Consumer Protection Act to provide enhanced penalties when a, when a harmful practice impacts, uh, is either targeted at or impacts a vulnerable community. They listed some that are non-exclusive, but race, national origin, disability, age, right? And it allows us to impose an enhanced penalty to businesses who target or impact those vulnerable communities. That statute um, went live in 2021, and our office is now starting to see the fruits of that. Our cases are starting to finish out, right, that we filed seeking that enhanced penalty, and we're now recovering it in cases where we're able to show that already burdened communities have been, have been the targets of um, unfair acts. And that's something that I'm really optimistic about because it's the justice system acknowledging, right, that unfairness doesn't visit on everyone equally. Um, I think one thing that's really um, positive that we're doing is, is again, looking at that Indigenous leadership and looking at Indigenous knowledge and really trying to incorporate some of the practices that tribes have been using for time immemorial to um, take care of the land and the river here, um, and really trying to figure out how to work that in and apply that in our current colonial structure. How do we use this knowledge that's really valuable and really important? Um, in a way that, you know, we can do it now, not necessarily having to wait for our systems to change, but how do we, how do we do that now? Um, so really looking at, and really, again, just listening to what um, the communities have to say and what they can bring to the table um, and considering ways to incorporate that into our uh, colonial structures. I, I've got, I, I guess, kind of two answers. One is um, uh, just really practical, you know, corporate criminal, criminal accountability is a big part of what we can do. Uh, there was a law that uh, that uh, passed a few years ago that increases corporate criminal fines in the state of Washington up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars for a misdemeanor and to a million dollars for felonies. Uh, that gives us tools that can really be meaningful when you're talking about companies violating emissions laws or 
uh, or filing fake discharge reports uh, for water discharge. So that's one one thing that, that I think has been recent uh, that has given us enormous uh, enforcement flexibility and leverage. More practically, I mentioned NEPA earlier. You know, NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act, is all about decision making processes. It's about looking before you leap. It's about studying something before you take action. And so the HEAL Act is all about that. The HEAL Act kind of requires state agencies to study the environmental justice impacts of what they're what they're going to do. Uh, I see uh, Manbir Sandhu is uh, here as one of our our uh, the people leading the way on implementing that in the AG's office. Uh, uh, the AG's office has opted into that statute. Uh, we weren't required to to comply with it, but it really sets a goal of uh, of changing our decision making process in a way that really has great potential as it as we all get used to it as it get, becomes more fully implemented. Uh, and uh, looking forward to seeing where that goes. Um, I just echo that that you know, we we lost some protections. Um, but at the same time, you know, maybe at the state level, we're implementing those that may have been lost at the federal level. Um, for instance, a super fund tax used to be a thing. Um, but now with with you know, with this recent legislation, now there are efforts and there is funding um, to look at this salmon reintroduction. And so now we have a phased approach where tribes and, you know, everybody's working together to, to come up with these resources and there's actually funding for it. Um, and, and so we're seeing these successes, we're seeing these fish make their way back up the rivers. Um, you know, when we're definitely not talking dam removals in our area, but you know, in other areas where the dams have been removed, the salmon are making their way back up right away. And so with that funding, we're already seeing some successes and gives us hope in our communities. Well, that is a wonderful, uh, hopeful end. Uh, I will just say one area that I am so thrilled about uh, is the uh, launching of the Environmental Task Force for the Eastern Washington District and the amazing partners that we are working with on that front. Um, and speaking about uh, holding businesses accountable, uh, the other strike force that our, our office uh, launched, gosh, two years ago now, was holding individuals who the defraud of the government uh, when we had PPP loans and other pandemic relief uh, loans available. And I was just doing a presentation on fraud with my white collar chief. And it was a really, a, he had an awesome visual where during the pandemic early on, there was a TikTok that actually was like, you can get free money, like telling people basically how they could defraud the government. And we are, you know, really being laser focused in our enforcement efforts there to uh, hold people accountable who defrauded the government and took money away from deserving businesses and people in a time when so many, you know, businesses that we know and love were, were going under because they didn't have the resources that they needed uh, during that crisis. And he had a follow up uh, uh, TikTok. Uh, video that actually was in relation to the incredible enforcement efforts that we've been making that was like the PPP police are after you and so there, there can be real meaningful uh you know community knowledge around when there is effective enforcement when there is the knowledge in the community that we won't stand for that and there is accountability when you violate the law and I'm very excited to have that collaboration among all of our stakeholders to hold people accountable and to know that we as a community have the values of environmental protection, the laws that reflect that, and the enforcement that demonstrates that. So again, thank you so much to the panelists and thank you for hanging with us this far in the day. We're doing great. <laughs>
So we have been introduced uh, to, of course, uh, Vanessa Waldorf and Cliff Villa. Uh, we also have joining us uh, for the first time up front today, my colleague, Dr. Greg Gordon, who's a professor of environmental studies and the chair of environmental studies and sciences department here at Gonzaga University, uh, an environmental historian uh, by training and disposition, Sorry. and is uh, sort of my, my, my wingman for, uh, for this. I have a habit of just pulling him into events where I need another person who uh, thinks and talks and teaches a lot about a topic to sort of interject some um, interesting questions and ideas. So we, I think we balance each other well. So thank you for joining us. Uh, so this panel, uh, our last session, as you know, is thinking about the future of environmental justice work um, in general and in, in our region. And I think uh, everything we've talked about today sets us up really nicely uh, for that. The first uh, question I wanted to pose is something that's come up regularly it has to do with the fact that uh, the law maybe is inherently, and I'm a philosopher, as as um, as you all might remember. So, forgive me if I'm if I'm wrong about this. But there's a sense in which is it fundamentally reactive, in that uh, it's it's trying to respond to something that's happened. And and I'm wondering, especially this came up, uh, Cliff. You mentioned that the definition of environmental justice uh, in you emphasized at one point that it includes risk and, and emphasized the idea of risk being included. And Katie Scott mentioned uh, that laws and standards uh, require the science to be able to, to be the basis of those. And that sometimes is, it takes a lot, a lot of time. And so as this concrete idea to how we might do that, is it possible to do something closer to the precautionary principle where we would invert the burden of proof to some degree, where rather than having to prove something is harmful, which takes, it's just very hard to do and takes a long time. Um, other jurisdictions uh, elsewhere in the world have, have tried to embed the precautionary principle into the law. Is that something that we could do? Are there reasons why we shouldn't do it? Uh, thoughts about the idea of the precautionary principle as one way of making the law less reactive. Uh, maybe start with you, Vanessa. Okay. This uh, question reminds me of my first year law school class. Um, where I was in an alternative law school program that was more theoretical than classic first year programs. And it was all about shifting the baseline. Um, and we did talk about like, well, regulations serve as a you know baseline principle, but then that's sort of the, you know, where the standard is, but what if we actually, you know, who bears the burden of that? So if historically, there was no environmental protection legislation and rules and laws. And so then we all bore the burden as individuals in our community. So now with laws, it feels restrictive and it feels like, oh, well, now businesses have to pay. Um, but the problem is the businesses weren't paying before. The community was paying, like with bearing all the burdens before. So I think it it takes a bit of a mind shift of like, oh, like the law as it is, isn't how the law has to be, uh, which is very challenging. So I think that the areas where we would struggle with precautionary principle are, is because we get very used to the baseline as it is and have a hard time imagining uh, that shift. And there are winners and losers when that when that shift occurs. And so that brings in the challenges of political power at the time, who has the power to make the laws. And it also uh, raises uh, just administrability issues as well. But I think it's a wonderful way to, to think about it and to uh, propose that as a, let's really think about who is externalizing the negative externalities of environmental, the lack of environmental regulation. Uh, that's a great thought. I think I actually will pick up on that idea of administrability. Um, so, you know, there are some experiments in precautionary principle, and we've is in some ways reflective of the idea that you should not do a thing until you've at least identified the potential impacts of the thing. NEPA, of course, doesn't tell you in the end that you shouldn't go ahead, that you can go ahead and, and eliminate the herd of, of, of elk in the Metal Valley, um, as long as you've studied and you decide that you want to really eliminate the, the elk in the Metal Valley. Um, but at least you have to know about it. And so there's sort of a, a at least a, a burden of, of gathering the information. Um, but there have been experiments in, in trying to incorporate 
uh, precautionary principle, but then you also immediately run into these questions of, of administrability and, and like, for example, notice. So under asbestos rules for regulation purposes, um, old regulations in the 1970s listed specifically six species of asbestos. What is asbestos? It is chrysotile. It is tremolite. It is these six things. And then we had this case in Liberty, Montana, where um, W.R. Grace was, was engaging in conduct um, and they were charged with crimes. Um, and their defense was that the thing that they were killing people with was, was not one of these six species of asbestos. And, um, and they were probably right because when the regs were written, we didn't have electron microscopes, we're looking at light microscopes. And when you start to drill down, they were finding like new species of asbestos when you can start to see things on 3D. And so the law is always gonna be behind technology. We'll never know exactly what um, all the flavors of asbestos is. And, and this week I'm thinking about what are all the flavors of PFAS? Um, and, and I actually had people in my office like trying to list them alphabetically. Um, and, uh, and we know we're never gonna be able to list all the species of, of PFAS and certainly not alphabetically. And so maybe what we need to do is, is not try to be that prescriptive, but really sort of describe the general problem, the thing that we're trying to solve. But as soon as we do that, someone's gonna say, but you didn't tell me about my chemical. Um, and, and how do we balance the rights of, of potential defendants and knowing what the law is versus the rights of the public in being protected? So it's, it's challenging. I would sort of err on the side of not providing too much description because it sort of presumes that we know everything and we don't. Um, and I think on, on the best kind of day, all we do know is that there are certain kinds of things that, that, that can injure people. And as a matter of precaution, we should perhaps be a little more general in thinking about um, what is it that we're trying to achieve versus trying to name all the possible things that could hurt you. So I'm wrestling with it right now, but these are real issues that will continue. Follow up? Or... I do, but I, I, I do, but I want like, like back to go back to so, um, what all afternoon I've been thinking about that kind of question. And what has been bothering me is, is why do we have a society that privileges producing toxic waste over human well-being? Um, and it's really getting at that a little more of a philosophical question, but then I, your point about precautionary principle puts that in, in, in the context of the legal context. And so there, there is a way of sort of turning it on its head and using something like the precautionary principle as the operative legal framework for which we sort of move forward with environmental justice for the next 50 years and sort of think, I mean, the EU has the precautionary principle embedded in the, the EU constitution. And so, and there are examples, and thank you for sharing the, the NEPA one. I mean, I was thinking the Endangered Species Act, right, is a good example. That's the precautionary principle. The FDA and the, the Frank Lautenberg food additives law. I mean, to Tosca. Yeah. yeah, that seems like a really good example of the precautionary principle in practice. So it seems like that we should, there's a, there must be some sort of way of, of our legal legislative priorities as or system as we're prioritizing something with precautionary principles that we're not producing, we're not a, no longer a society that's producing waste that is toxic to humans and other life forms i think i think we're on the same page but to push back a little bit on um, or clarify with with cliff and, and vanessa so is the administrative difficulty so we, we heard from the city for example it's just not realistic to imagine that we always have to figure out how to clean the water at the end of the pipe if we don't ever figure out how do we stop creating harmful things where it's, it's always what about the upstream so, as I take it, one of the key points of the precautionary principle is that it's inverting the burden of proof to have, let's say, a, a company wants to create a new chemical and they're like, it's the best thing ever. And you're like, prove it. And right now, is the hard part that you can't achieve that burden? You can't prove that it will not be harmful. Like it, they would say, it will take decades to prove that it's going to have no harmful consequences. And my reaction is, it takes decades to prove that your substance is harmful and why should we always be having to 
just take it on. You, you put it into the system and then it's our job to prove that it's, to show you how it's harmful. Why not just say, no, yeah, if it takes decades, I mean, you, you're rich, I'm not. You, you have more resources than I do to try and prove that it's not harmful. You prove that it's, as far as we can tell, it's benign and then implement it into the system. Is, is, what's, is that not possible or is that not reasonable? I'll have a, a thought. I mean, um, I think it, it is possible. I mean, the FDA has testing for drugs, right? And we managed to get we managed to get drugs to you know for COVID, right? Um, on a pretty fast track. But the thing is that you know technology advances so fast, and especially now, imagine the world of AI, where you could be inventing thousands of chemicals a second, right? And they can't all possibly go through review system. We could say don't do it. But we also, like AI, we, we can't always stop it. Um, and could. <laughs> we, could, we could choose to make it slower on purpose in order because of the consequences of having not done that for, I mean, it hasn't, it hasn't obviously worked out great to just simply say, it's just too fast. The market's just too fast. You're like, well, we, we choose to let it be that way. We could choose to make it slower. Um, now, profit motives involved would not like that, I grant you, but. Um, I, I just heard that some people had like written every song that is possible, um, and uh, and like wow, that's that's interesting. You wrote every song that is possible. Um, I, I just think that that technology is really going to be a a a continuing challenge. I certainly understand the the principle, and I I would love to be more conscious as well. But I think we live in a world where where technology will go with or without us, and uh, and we just need to do our best to make sure that we're protecting people as best we can. But... I would kind of simply say like the concern that I think would be raised is the stifling of innovation. And if we can't ever know if something is truly safe, then are we missing out on what a risk benefit analysis of like, well, this is safer than what we have before, but we don't want to hold up on something because of the legal regime that actually allows something less safe than something more safe. So I think that sometimes we trap ourselves in uh conundrums <laughs> that don't allow for uh, candid conversations around, well, let's have real discussions around the risks and benefits of this innovation versus uh, another you know, thing that did make it to the market before, but isn't ha has other problems. Good question for philosophers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is what happens when you let me moderate. I get to <laughs> storing up all day. <laughs> I didn't write any ahead of time. It's just sort of uh, thinking about the really interesting conversations we've had today. Uh, because we live in a part of the world, and I think this is true of many parts of our country, uh, as we think about what it is to do environmental justice work in the coming 50 years, and I think about doing that in our neighborhood in particular, um, how would you respond to someone who says environmental justice uh, is uh, foreign to their interests or that they would say it's woke. It's just, um, but I don't think that's come through today, but I think it's helpful to sort of put it on the table and say, people who, who say that's not, that's not me, what's the way of, of having a conversation say, well, actually, it, it, is that true? It, I'm, I'm, do you have a response for someone who thinks it's part of the culture wars? I very much worry that environmental justice conversations, which today have been, I think we've shown how broad and interesting and important they are to so many different community members um, today in the conversations, but that will be part of the weaponization and the culture wars where we'll just get sucked into the rabbit hole of, of partisan politics. Uh, do you have a couple of sort of elevator pitches for how that, that's a, a bad framing? Any, uh, anyone want to start? I'm going to steal from Cliff on this one, where we talked in uh, today's events about it benefits all people. So environmental protection and environmental justice is absolutely impacting everyone positively. Uh, I do worry about this, too, because I, I think that the more that we can tie environmental protection and environmental justice to just the values that we want to live as a society, having it be very concrete around, we all want clean air, we all want clean water, we want our kids to be safe at school, we want our kids to be safe at home, we want a community where we feel that we are not at risk from toxins. So I think if we stick around to like, we want these values, then we're going to agree on those values, and then we can have real discussions about what do we do to ensure that we are protecting those values. 
I love that so much. Um, so here's another elevator pitch. Um, so who do we love? Who do we like across the board? Who do we love um, as as a culture, as a nation? Um, we love people in in the military service, right? Um, we love we love teachers. We love firefighters. Um, and and if you ask a firefighter, like running to the scene of, of a house fire, like which which house should get the water? It's it's the house on fire, right? Um, and um, and environmental justice is, is just like that. Um, who's the one who we should make sure that we're 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 clean the water? It's a, what's the one without clean water, right? Who, who's the community who should be getting clean air? Well, it's the community that does not have clean air, right? And and it's really just understanding like what is the problem? It's the house on fire. They're the one that gets the water. We don't have to put water on every single house on the neighborhood. Um, it's just we're fixing the problem. And and if you know, I think we get there from just understanding that firefighters have an important job. They put out fires. Uh, environmental regulators have important jobs. We regulate. We fix the problem. And it happens. You don't have to go into this in the elevator unless it's a really tall building. It, it happens that not every house is on fire. And, 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 uh, and some houses may take more water to put out the fire. Um, but we're all wanting the same thing, which is we don't want any of the houses to be on fire. Um, so let your firefighters do their work and, and let, you know, environmental law do, do the work that it's designed to do too. And then we don't have to talk about environmental justice. We're just talking about fixing the problem in front of us. Wow. Thanks. Thanks for those. those work. Um, I, I want to do want to take issue that we do love teachers to the extent that we love those other, um, enter those other professions to this, to this equal amount. Um, but I actually, I had a question for you all, kind of along those lines, is, and I was thinking about this on, on the last panel, is, is there a reason that we sort of categorize things as environmental justice, environmental protection, and civil rights? When I was listening to the folks um, on the last hour, it seemed like they were all talking about the same thing. And I just wonder if, if at some point that... They, those things merge and we just we're just talking about one thing civil rights environmental protection and environmental justice are all just different names for the same thing that we're doing yeah um i think there's a danger in in i mean i'll just say there's a danger in broadening environmental justice to be everything because then you start to lose a sense of priorities so i think a lot of people when they talk about environmental justice they're talking very specifically about human health um, and then you think, well, what about the salmon? What about the spotted owl? What about, and and I think if you begin with human-centered, although there's no reason to do that, but if you're a philosopher, you might. Um, if, if you begin just thinking about protecting humans, you might think about what it takes to protect humans. So in my book on environmental justice, I sort of raise this question, wrestle with it a little bit, and you can almost always find that humans are absolutely part of the ecology. Um, if you are a, a member of an Inuit community on the North Slope of Alaska, your existence depends on the migratory patterns of bowhead whales. And that's why they're there. And, and, you, and you can sort of make those connections in many other ways. Communities are where they are because they have the resources that they need. And so if you care about humans on the North Slope of Alaska, you have to care about bowhead whales. Um, you may care about the environment for the environment. You may care for the, the river because you think it has a right to exist itself. And that's that's totally legitimate. But I think most people, when they're talking about environmental justice, they're talking about human health, although not necessarily so. Civil rights, I think, is one way of getting towards this kind of protection. It is a, a body of law, like environmental statutes, like maybe toxic tort actions, that can achieve some kind of end. So I, I see them all as related. But People may have different conceptions of it, and that's that's totally up to them as well. It's all about identifying the problems we need to solve and finding tools to solve them. Just piggybacking off of that exact last comment of identifying the problems and finding the tools. And the way that the law is, is that it's often pretty segmented. It's like, I do this kind of work. I do civil rights work. I do environmental work. I do you know white collar work. And... I think we have these different labels because that's what we're comfortable with. We say like, oh, I'm this a specialist in this area. And so when I am serving on this comprehensive environmental justice enforcement uh, strategy team with the Department of Justice, I kind of need to convince other people. I'm like, oh, no, you're already doing environmental justice work like FBI. Like when you're supporting us on these investigations, that's environmental justice work. And so it's different 
categories. And so we're trying to make the umbrella big enough, but it's, we don't, uh, lawyers often think about our roles narrowly and it's a little bit of work sometimes to broaden our mindset around, oh, well, maybe this tool is one that I'm not as familiar with, but is a better mechanism to achieve the goal of solving the problem. And just one thought, because you may have a copy, those principles of environmental justice, if you read them, they're really interesting and expansive. They actually do talk about a right for the animal world. They talk about food. They talk about many different rights. And, and I've had these conversations in my own class, like, well, which one is the most important? And of course, it's a ridiculous question. It, it, they're all there because somebody thought it was important enough to articulate it. And I think that's great. We don't, we don't have to choose whether it's the bowhead veil or it's or it's the community that depends on it. Um, you know, it, it you make your choices based on, on your own values. I very much want to come back to that because I was just grabbing from a, a friend here that list and I want to come back, but um, I'm going to make them as sort of the professor sort of, uh, I, I noticed with some of our panelists from earlier, I, have, I could be wrong, Colleen, that I, I saw, thought I saw you nodding when uh, Greg was uh, formulating his question about different kinds of, of law. I'm just curious, since you do civil rights uh, as your area, were you nodding? Do you have thoughts on, on this question? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that they're the same all the time, but where they, where they are the same, we should say so. So that's what I was nodding along to that, is that if I'm doing a civil rights case that's clearly an environmental justice case, I should talk about it that way in order to bring people along and to bring people in who might not, you know, civil rights, you know, people feel all kinds of ways, depending on how they're feeling, but they might be drawn to the case or be more supportive if they understood it through an environmental frame. So I think of it more as an opportunity, right? That where there is that crossover, magnify, amplify, take advantage and, and talk about them as, as, as the same as together. I'm told that cold calling is a thing in law school. So <laughs> then you're not put off by that. Sorry. It's just, it's, uh, I want to pick up uh, Cliff on, on your on your point because that was another one of the questions I had. And it is a philosophical question, and it sounds like one that you um, have thought already about. One and so I teach environmental ethics and we do a unit on environmental justice. And then uh, the EPA definition arguably is uh, what the environmental ethicists call anthropocentric. It's interested in uh, humans, and I'm interested in humans too. Uh, and arguably, the way that our legal system is set up, it's it, it's able to recognize the value of, uh, of of humans and try and protect all humans equally and give them equal access. Um, but it's not really set up to recognize uh, non-human values for their own sake. Um, so we can protect them uh, for you know creative reasons to show how it it comes back around to a person who has legal standing who's been harmed. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're not able to uh, bring suit uh, on behalf of something for its own its own sake. But the first uh, principle in 1991 and the principles of justice uh, that was adopted was, and not that it's most important, but the first one that was listed uh, that they agreed to was environmental justice affirms the sacredness of Mother Earth, ecological unity, and the interdependence of all species, and the right to be free from ecological destruction. And so why, uh, there wasn't a lot of interest in the rights of nature. Okay, so uh, maybe that's not the formulation you like, but this idea of, um, it as a question, is environmental justice inherently anthropocentric? Meaning it's, we can only talk about humans access to nature, uh, but, not, but not have any concern with the justice for on behalf of the river or of the fish. Uh, and so it's just, it's, environmental justice is just not the vehicle that'll get us there, or would you be interested in, in allowing it to expand and include those uh, aspects as well? Well, my own thought is that um, I, I do worry that expanding environmental justice to mean everything means that that we begin to lose focus. Tell me what, what you're interested in. Um, you know, I think we were comfortable talking about ecology at one point, right? 1970s, that was big. Um, and uh, and and it's certainly as valid as, as it ever was. Um, it's okay to talk about the rights of animals and other species. If that's what we wanna talk about, let's, let's talk about that as well. Um, you know, I actually think most of, of our work at EPA is, is it's about public health. Um, and, uh, and, you know, let's, let's talk about what it takes to protect public health and, and kids with asthma. Um, and so, you know, I think it helps to, to, to just achieve some sort of understanding of what it is we're going to talk about. Environmental justice helped us to sort of focus on, on cases of injustice, of, of disproportionate impacts. But, but now that we're, we're, we're seeing it, 
we kind of need to get even more specific. What are we talking about now? Are we talking about impacts to to um, to women and and uh, and children? Are we talking about impacts to to older people? Are, um, and uh, and just just understand and respect that that environmental justice can mean a lot of different things to people. And I'm absolutely going to respect that. Um, but at some point, we need to, to start moving on to think about what's the problem we're going to solve today. Part of the answer to the question that determines what counts as a problem in a way, right? So we talk about water rights could be rights to water or the rights of, of water. And so uh, if you're interested in the latter also, then certain things are problems to be solved. Whereas if you say the former, certain things aren't even problems necessarily. So the that initial question makes a big difference as to what even counts as a problem, which interests me. I just got to say, I mean, the great thing about the environment space is there's room for everyone. Uh, I think there's an organization that's been fighting for years to protect spot owls, like, right on, go do that. Um, and uh, and there's other organizations that are going to focus on, on other problems. Like, we, we don't have to choose. It's a great big tent. Did you want to get in at all, Vanessa? No, you're good. All right, fair enough. <laughs> Actually, I wonder if, if we might hear from um, the Native perspective on that, because it seems to me that I'm thinking about when you mentioned water and water rights, I'm thinking about the, the, no, the no dapple pipeline protests and the whole slogan or the, the rallying cry was water is life. And I think for Native communities that maybe those things aren't separate. It's not like water rights for us or for somebody else or rights of the river itself, that there's not a there's not that kind of clear distinction. But I'm I'm just throwing that out there and wondering if we've got two wonderful people who could take a stab at it with the Um I would just say from from our teachings about about that and you know, kind of ties back into the work here with the Spokane River about some of these impacting women more, you know, pregnant women. And, you know, it, it it's just like that right from, you know, the right for our babies to be born safely, um, our rights to gather. Um, one of the things that my daughter does when we go to the river is, and she was, you know, a baby, just kind of learning to walk and would go and kneel down and take a drink of the water. And I'm like, ah, you know, don't do that. Um, but we, we look at, you know, the sacredness of our women and just carrying babies in water. And that, you know, that that that's the start of our life. And so that we really have to look at the, you know, anything that's going to impact that. And um the whole co the community as a whole, I think that that's really what um what came out of that is that, you know, once we protect the water, then it's gonna you know, human health, animal health, plant health, you know, it, it, the water definitely impacts everything. Thank you, Twala. Uh, also reminded of, uh, some of you may be fans of uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, uh, Braiding Sweetgrass, and uh, she's with Pot Potomatami, uh, Northern Plains, uh, or Great Lakes area, and uh, she writes beautifully about uh, the, the view of, of all of the relationship of, of the community of life as a kinship relationship, rather than a person property relationship and so if you th see everything as kin that's a fundamentally different relational starting point than you know one where you start off who owns what and what can i do with what i own and what am i not allowed to do with what i own so it's just a it's there's a difficult it, maybe not i hope i hope it's not incommensurable but it's just a very fundamentally different worldview and starting point um but I'm hoping that sort of a kin model could be infused more. I don't know, Margo, you feel like getting in or not, but. Just one comment. Um, when I uh, speak to city council or people about water, um, I talk about our Nepai uh, relatives in Alaska. When they have their council meetings, um, they will pass around a bucket of dirt, soil. And uh, the the tribal leaders, and the they, they take a scoop and they eat it because they understand that what happens to the earth happens to us. And so when I talk to Spokane City Council, I often I'll go down to the river and get a jar of water and I tell them about the Napaimu and I say, how, how would it be if we started each of our Spokane City Council meetings by taking a drink of our Spokane River? What kind of relationship and perspective would that provide us? 
because in many ways, that's what exactly what we're doing when our aquifers connect to the river. Brian, can I respond to that? I, 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 this is so great. How long does this go to 10 p.m. tonight? Um, so what counts as a problem? I love that. So let, let me tell you, when I was a law student, um, I was doing some research on the Columbia River Treaty, a treaty between the U.S. and Canada over uh, constructing and operating dams. And there's a, um, there's a word, a magic word in the treaty that says the dams will be operated for optimum power generation. And, and I did all this research on what they meant when they wrote the word optimum in 1950. And, uh, and, and we're, thinking about, uh, we're thinking about salmon and fish passage. Um, and like, could you operate the dams in such a way today that would help fish move down the river? And when I did the research on, on the negotiations, it was very clear that they understood optimum basically to, to mean maximum, that run those dams for power. Um, and they knew it would decimate the, the wild salmon runs. And they also decided that that was okay because they're gonna build really big reservoirs that they could stock with striped bass. So for them, it was not a problem that you would decimate this resources, essential natural resource, cultural resource, that was not a problem because you could stock it with bass and people would catch the bass. Um, now we understand like, whoa, what? You know, and, um, and, and it, just, it just highlights that there's all kinds of things that we would not have imagined were problems before. We never imagined that we might need a gender neutral bathroom, right? Um, it's sometime in our not distant past. One of the things that we're not seeing now. Um, we actually had Robin Wall Kimmer come to our, our office and sort of talk with us, and we all read Braiding Sweetgrass together, and it really was enlightening. I, I, I feel like, man, I could go back to school for the next 20 years and, and keep learning. Um, I don't know what I don't know, um, but it's a great question to ask, what do we call a problem? So my, my next question to ponder is, um, and as we think about the future, is the durability of what we're doing today, and this has come up a several times, and we know we're in an interesting uh, political moment of our of our country's history. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on whether or not we're just sort of going to have a, a whipsaw sort of uh, uh, relationship to doing this work when uh, this administration has the Justice 40 initiative, which is um, trying to direct at least 40% of uh, federal uh, dollars to communities who are uh, his historically overburdened um, environmental justice communities. Uh, and so if we get enough for administration, that would, I would presumably go away, I think. But I'm curious, uh, the version that kind of popped into my head was Jimmy Carter and the solar panels on the White House. That's sort of a classic example of sort of, you know, Carter puts the solar panels on the White House, Reagan gets elected and takes them down. You know, sort of like, and uh, so how durable is what's going on now, what we're fighting so hard to achieve uh, going to be, or is it really just super vulnerable and and going to just be at the whims of what, what whatever happens every four uh, or eight years? Um, uh, we were just yeah. talking about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So sure, I'll, I'll start. I think we'll probably both have thoughts on that. So I think it's both yes and no that is vulnerable. Um, as I was uh, speaking at a little bit in the enforcement panel, so many of our environmental regulations go through you know this process of notice and comment, and it takes about three years of an administration to have them come out. Uh, so there's many new regulations that are coming out right now that were priorities of the Biden administration, and you know. It would probably take about three years for new regulations under a new administration to come out that would potentially impact uh, the current regulations. And so there, there is that up and down, and that is pretty frustrating uh, when the regulations you like are no longer in place. Um, but there's still value and benefit in doing that, even if there is an up and down, because it sets the new you know expectations. So if we have expectations for emission standards at a certain amount, then there's a whole infrastructure of how cars then need to meet those emission standards. And so that infrastructure is built for our car companies to, to do that. And that generally doesn't go back in time. And so 
there, there's still that incredible value for when the more protective regulation sets the standard and then industry follows that there is a long-term infrastructure benefit. Um, and just makes me think of what I'm trying to do right now in my office is build an infrastructure so that even if I'm not in the role that I have right now, I have people who are trained up to do environmental work. We've made meaningful connections with our state partners so we can continue doing that work even if there's a different person uh, in, the, in the White House or in the executive positions throughout the government. Oh, that's so good. So building our workforce is really key. Um, I'm a political, but, but everyone I'm hiring, they're going to be career people and they will have protection. And uh, and we want a new generation of people who could be asking these questions and finding answers. Um, also, you know, I, I don't want to put too much of a, of an emphasis on, on one idea or, or another. Um, you know, there's a danger in in, in overemphasizing environmental justice because because then people could say, oh, you know, that was that was those that last people. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if we frame it as well, you know, we put out fires, right? We we, we solve problems, um, and also, you know, for example, when we talk about cumulative impacts, um, that should just be part of of any good practice going forward when we're doing risk assessment, um, which is always something that that we have done. It's just another way of advancing science, like, oh, now I understand that people breathe and they drink water. Um, and, uh, and that is a thing that we should just always do going forward. We can't not understand that people don't breathe and drink water. Um, and so we should always be doing that from 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 here on. Um, and I don't have to call that environmental justice. I don't you have to give it a label. If, if anything, it's just it's just good science. We have learned something about how to do our work better. And, and those are the kind of things that I really hope will endure, regardless of, of whatever label or priority or other thing that, that one party takes or another. All right, before I open it up to the, the room, so um, uh, if you don't already have a question prepared, this one is truly off the philosophical deep end, I suspect. So. Forgive me, but I've got the microphone. So uh, in my environmental ethics class, one of the uh, culminating points of the, of the course, we've been largely focusing on uh, this idea that how we ended up in this moment of ecological crisis is largely due to a uh, problematic worldview, we'll call it, a set of attitudes and beliefs. And on the dominant sort of claim is that we we have arrived at this moment of crisis and can't really solve the crisis unless we have a more adequate set of values and beliefs, a, a more adequate worldview. So we spend the semester looking at different answers to that. We'll look at a biocentric perspectives and ecocentric perspectives, and we'll, we'll look at different worldviews that would be non-anthropocentric, that would, that would recognize the intrinsic value of, of other things. And then we get to the moment of the class where, where we look at a different set of philosophers who say that's fundamentally mistaken uh, we don't need to and shouldn't try to think about and change what people believe. The whole attempt to change attitudes and assumptions and beliefs, the whole hearts and minds approach, we, we don't have time and it's a fool's errand. We, we, you, the, the, the timelines are just against us, especially with climate change, but also with the species extinction, but all the other many forms of pollution, people's lives uh, are depending on it. So changing people's beliefs is too long, too slow, um, and also, uh, we, we, you can't anyway. And so they would say, you should just pass good policy, or good regulations, and, and enforce the heck out of them. And so it's in my head today about, uh, and then Jerry Whitehead in the morning kind of hinted at it. I, he, I heard him say, and I don't want to put words into his mouth, but I heard him say, or if he didn't, I am, saying that uh, there's this interesting relationship between values, what we believe, and, and the laws that we have, that we pursue, uh, and how they um, are, are implemented in our community. So on the one hand, then we have this strong view, the philosophical view that part of our work, not all of it, but part of our work is conceptual and values-based. It's this idea of changing hearts and minds is part of the long-term work of solving the, the, the climate crisis and the extinction crisis is, is partly conceptual. And on the other hand, you got this view that no, it's just a policy regulation. Legal, you know, you just simply need to build better economic systems and deploy better technology, and you shouldn't try to change anybody's minds. I'm just curious if that's really unfair, but if you have any thoughts about whether or not both of those are needed or just one, I don't know. That's 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 unfair, but fun. 
it is it is a lot. It's about, <laughs> I guess what uh, I have a hard time with philosophers is I'm like, I, I don't know, this is the world as it is. That's all I know. And so I I would have to say it has to be both um, because the, we have to change enough hearts and minds for our political systems and the political powers that exist to be able to pass the laws so that we can enforce it, to have the policy. And so, I mean, the we can talk about, do we have the right political system? Is democracy working in the United States? You know, so all of these bigger challenges, but we do have the system that we have. If we can get Congress to act and make policy and make laws that are going to be beneficial, then we got to do that. And that's going to require the social movements, the social action, and the changing of hearts and minds to be based around values that we can all agree on. What are the things that we can get done? And that's what we need to focus our efforts on. Yeah. Um, this this does remind me of a conversation I, I had in uh, in this local area some time ago. We're doing a lot of cleanup on on in the Silver Valley. And you know, there was a lot of opposition to our work there. Um, and uh, and we had death threats, in fact. Um, and if, if I was in Seattle, they would be saying like, you know, yay, go environment um, stuff. And, um, but that's, that's not always true in, in every place, but I, I could still get to the same place of like, do you care about your lake? Um, and it turns out that a lot of people really care about protecting places like Lake Coeur d'Alene. Um, and I don't have to put a label on that now. Um, we just agreed that protecting the lake is a really valuable thing for a lot of reasons. We also agreed that protecting air quality is, is a good thing for many reasons, because we, we can't see the mountains if they're covered in smog. Um, um, and, uh, and so if we could find those things that we could agree on, I think that there's really a lot more. Um, it would be nice to capture that crazy, you know, decade of the 1970s when overwhelmingly Congress supported uh, the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. And there's still something in there that we still do like clean water. We still do like places where we can hunt and fish. Um, and I think there's a strong enough um, current that we could get there, even if we're not forcing people to be on one side of, of a, of a, you know, a perspective or another. I, I really do hope and believe, um, and maybe I'm naive enough to keep moving on it one day at a time and see how far we got. Well, um, I don't know. If we don't change our values to be less extractivism oriented and more in relation in relation to others in relation to the biosphere then what's the point i mean we would just continue to engage in the same thing i mean the parts per million of co2 just keeps going up you know we've passed laws we have conferences there's i mean we've done some we've made a lot a lot of progress in cleaning up some waterways and cleaning up our air, but we haven't even met, the Clean Air Act was passed, or the Clean Water Act was passed in 1972. And it says, the very first line, right? Somebody mentioned, it says, all the waters, all the navigable waters in the United States will be fishable and, clean, and fishable and swimmable in 1985 and 1986. That didn't happen. But the idea, the value behind that, that we wanted to be in relationship with our waterways, those values that we need to continue to, I don't know, focus on or um, celebrate and advance. It seems like, I mean, you're, like Cliff said, that they're there, but if we, if we just drop those for pragmatic reasons to get I mean, not there's anything wrong with good legislation, <laughs> but if we're just focused on the pragmatic outcomes and we lose that sense of why we're doing it, then it seems like that we're just short circuiting where we're going. Thank you for putting up with me. This is what you get when you make a philosopher in charge of the Climate Institute, if you were wondering. Uh, we do have a little bit of time. If there are any questions that have been burning today, uh, we've got the first one from Mr. Eichstatt. <laughs> 
I guess this is might be more philosophical. Um, <laughs> I guess, you know, we all agree we need to deal with climate. And this administration is doing pretty aggressive actions to address it. Unfortunately, we are seeing instances where those actions are bumping up against indigenous rights. Uh, half a dozen tribes oppose the lithium mine in Nevada, Thacker Pass mine. Four tribes in California, at least one in Oregon, National Congress of American Indians, affiliated tribes of Northwest, Northwest Indians have come out against offshore wind development. Um, locally, Kalispell tribe opposed the uh, smelter up in Newport and over in central part of the state, the Yakima tribe has come out against a big pump storage project. All of these, you know, for quote unquote green energy, but they're bumping up against rights of tribes, cultural resources, fisheries, other, you know, uh, sacred sites. Um, how do we balance this? You know, what trumps is our zeal to deal with climate more important than indigenous rights? And where does environmental justice fall there? You want to throw me on that one? <laughs> <laughs> I have my counsel here, so she'll, she'll kick me when it's time. Um, yeah, I mean, if anybody in the room has an answer to that, I'd, I'd love to hear it. But I mean, I can give a half a dozen more examples too. There, there are Native Hawaiian groups who are opposing wind development on Maui. There are Pueblos in New Mexico who opposed wind development um, as well. Um, but you, you need to drill down and to ask the question, why? They're, they're not inherently against uh, clean energy, but is it fair to put all the wind turbines on sacred sites in, in Maui um, when everybody else is building million dollar condos and they don't have to deal with that? Um, or maybe if you allowed them the upside of the clean energy from those energy facilities that you're building in the backyard, you could build effective partnerships. But that meaningful involvement part of environmental justice turns out to be really involved, important. If they're a part of the planning, if they're a part of the project, I think you get a lot more support than just like doing it and then asking for permission after the fact. We've got to learn those lessons, but we've got to learn them super fast um, because we do need to develop clean energy as, as fast as possible. We just got to do it smarter than we've done it before. Jump in. I think that's good. Yeah, well done. Um, I'm Elaine Harger. And I, this has all been very fascinating today. Um, you know, it seems to me that part of the problem, I mean, just given the example that we've had with um, wind farms, and of course, there are people who want to have portable nuclear power plants. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on, right? All of that is about maintaining a lifestyle that is destroying the planet. Now, a bunch of you probably came here in an airplane um, Boeing is planning on building a new factory. I've, I've read in the newspaper somewhere here in Spokane, and the zoning laws need to be changed for that to happen. Um, I've never seen this document until today, and, and this is probably um, one of the most valuable things um, that I've seen, but number 17 says that environmental just, justice requires that we as individuals make personal and, and consumer choices to consume as little of Mother Earth's resources and to produce as little waste as possible. I think that this is something that really needs to enter into this conversation because all we're doing is just trying to, you know, put off um, actually engaging in that work until you know things have gotten so bad that that you know there's nothing that we're going to be able to do about it. I couldn't agree more. Um, and I kind of get guess it gets back to Rick's really excellent question about what do we do when these you know things come into conflict? Um, and I think it's kind of goes back to that idea of of are we immersed in extractivism as a way of solving our problems we need to make a clean energy transition 
but as we build more wind turbines and more wind farms and put out more transmission lines, in many ways, that's just meeting the increased demand for electricity. We're still not, we're not reducing our dependence upon electricity. We're just meeting the increased future demand. And so kind of come back to the idea of it, it, if we're operating from a sense of being in relationship to each other, in relationship to you know, the biosphere, the ecosystem, we're thinking of that in, in along those lines, rather than the lines of we need lithium to get those batteries, we need more wind turbines to get more electricity. Yeah, we need, we need that, but we're not doing it in a way that's eliminating the coal and um, natural gas plants and all the other infrastructure because we, we need, we're going to need more electricity, not less. And maybe it's really hard, I think, for our society to think about doing with less. And I don't know how to solve that problem. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one last question. Thank you. I think that's really the, the key. We're trying to, we're caught in trying to keep going what we've got or changing what we've got. And, and the hope would be that we would choose to change because it's so much easier. The reality may be that we don't make the choice, but nature will make it for us. And I think part of what we've been grappling with in terms of, of values and change, it is so hard to move from being human-centric to being life-centric. And being life-centric sets up a value system that answers a lot of these questions, actually, if it's part of our conversation, does this really make life thrive? Not just better, because we can we can finesse the better for us, but does it keep life thriving? And not only our life, but every life thriving. If we can hit that space, maybe we can make those changes. But I think the, um, the pressure of money um, and the pressure of our illusion of progress really get in our way of making these changes. So I, I it's more a statement <laughs> than a question. Um, I don't know the answer. Thank you for coming in. You know, you reminded me of something that um, Margo didn't get to, to hit on and then I'm gonna um, make my friend Nagmana happy about. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I, I'm thinking of, if you could sort of tee up the, maybe you wanna come up real fast? Because, uh, you know, doing the cold calling thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the history of the expo and that fourth point of, of the legislative um, action part. Certainly. Um, so one thing we uh, kind of looked at when expo, Expo's 50th anniversary celebration topics came about, and I was already kind of getting into these discussions anyways, and thinking about how does climate change kind of run through housing and homelessness, immigrants and refugees, youth, jobs, education, enrollment numbers are down, you know, why is that? What's gonna happen in, in, in our system, in our society here, Spokane, what's gonna look like by the year 2030, by the year 2050, because all our cities' populations are going to be centered around cities. And so who's doing the farming? Where's the water coming from? You know, so, so many different things. Changing weather patterns, you know, climate change, we already did this work with citizen-based science around the heat, um, uh, heat dome. And so I was looking at all of that and thinking, how can I create more awareness around that? So we decided on this legislative summit. I hosted these six um, sessions in November and December, and then I'm bringing everybody back again on, the, uh, on June 21st um, in, in Spokane. You're all welcome to attend. Please be there if, you, if at all possible. And um, the idea is put everybody in a room with subject matter experts like Brian here or uh, Vanessa or Margot, and you know they're in their typical, uh, uh, very specific work groups. And the idea is to take what's being talked about in the room, and we have some props from our uh, previous work groups, right, in November, December. So everybody's coming in with some idea of what they want to talk about, what what they crafted, 
And then we're bringing some legislators over from the West side and putting, that's their jam, right? So who's working on housing and homelessness, say Senator McCree or um, um, uh, Senator Joan Wen and Beth Dolio who work on climate and the environment. Our legislators who are immigrants and refugees like yes, Yasmin Trudeau or Milan Thai. So people who have the lived experience and, and, and maybe Chris Stearns and Deborah Kaufman, you know, who, who are indigenous people who are working in the legislature and then bring them in to talk about the intersectionality or the cross section of climate justice and what your values are and what you're working on right now and what, what the needs of Spokaneites are. And so we're, we're putting everybody together. We've got the governor coming. He's going to be speaking. Mayor Lisa Brown is speaking. We've invited Secretary of the Interior, uh, Deb Holland, to come. We're very hopeful that she will come. Maybe somebody in DC can push. That would be great. And um, so the idea is the needs in Spokane are a little bit different than what they are on the other side of the Cascades. So if we recognize that, and when as, as, as Spokaneites, all we do is are able to zoom in and say, this is important to us, therefore we say pro or con. And that's about it. Give a testimony either on the phone or you know on Zoom and then you're done. But this gives the opportunity to not just our legislators, but our people here in Spokane who are subject matter experts in those realms of experience stand up and say, this is what our needs are. And then if it comes through and becomes law, just like how it, it's, it's reverse engineering. And so the idea is, um, so Margo and Jeff are um, um, chairs of the tribal pillar and they have helped me create an epic day, basically. So what we try to do is to have everything that we can do to kind of showcase our needs and our legislators, and then make sure that everybody understands that, you know, th these are our values. And so we have a native opening ceremony, then we go to breakfast, then we um, go across, because we'll be at the convention center, which is on the river. And so we'll just walk over to um, either the floating dock or the red wagon, depends. <clears throat> and we'll have a Colville tribal salmon chief do a salmon ceremony. And so it's a symbolic, symbolic salmon ceremony, and then we'll take it from there uh, to go, come back to lunch, where we hopefully will have Secretary Holland speak and the governor is speaking at lunch. And then we'll move from there to um, you know, hear from everybody in the room what piece of legislation was created. And then we're gonna hand it over to our legislators to take it to the 2025 legislative session in Olympia and sponsor that piece of legislation. And we're gonna track it and see, did it go through? Did it not go through? If it didn't go through, why did it go through? Maybe we can bring it back again in 2026. So, um, you know, this is going to be pretty epic. Uh, the um, event is up on the calendar, Expo calendar at the moment with some details, but the link to register is coming soon. So watch the space. Thank you. And we're also gonna have a salmon, oh, we're gonna have a dinner. After we're gonna talk to Pavilion, um, I think we've got a bubble. One of the things I was excited to end on this is because Expo was um, was great, but it didn't necessarily result in long-term legislative and policy improvements. And so this is our opportunity 50 years later to sort of push on, on those policy uh, changes. Let's uh, thank uh, our, our panelists and all of the speakers for today. Uh, I hope you come to future Climate Institute uh, events. We host events every semester and you can find us uh, online. Uh, we are gonna ho have a, a quick group photo uh, for anybody who's interested. If you would please come up front and we'll take a couple of quick pictures before going down the hall uh, to a nice reception. So thanks again for coming. Can we take a picture together? I would love it. I would love yeah. that too. <laughs>